Okay, good night, good night, good night. Good night to everyone. I trust you guys are doing well as usual. This is another one of my impromptu uh, teachings, all right? And for those of you that didn't know, I'm back. <laughs> my weekend was quite, quite busy. I had uh, two separate speaking engagement. Uh, the first one was the uh, Tiffany Montgomery. Tiffany Montgomery's Millions Conference in uh, Houston, Texas. So I was the uh, one of the surprise guest speakers on on Friday afternoon. <laughs> a lot of you wrote me and asked me, "Are you going to the Millions Conference? Are you going to be a speaker?" And I said to you, uh, "Millions Conference? What, what's that?" Of course, I had to play crazy because I I could not say that I was the guest speaker. So a lot of folks that were there <laughs> who I spoke with, some of them face to face, <laughs> was kind of shocked uh, to see me up there. <clears throat> but I want to thank you for all of your support. Millions Conference was an excellent event, and it is one that I would highly recommend that uh, Christian business people, or even non-Christian alike, uh, attend those conferences. It was a business conference, a Christian business conference, and uh, of course, I would have given my my two cents in there. I we had a I met a lot of Bahamians. <laughs> I, had a, I met a lot of Bahamians uh, over there. In fact, when I flew out of Freeport, where I live, into Nassau to take my connecting flight to Houston, uh, I met a a wonderful Bahamian who works for uh, the tour, tourist board there in Nassau. She was at the airport. And uh, she recognized who I was, and we had a beautiful conversation. In fact, she's in some of the photos that I would have posted. But uh, I was just so shocked about the amount of people in Nassau that actually follows uh, this ministry. Uh, it was just amazing. From the TSA agents to the front counter at the airlines, and I mean, you name it, DJ and I were uh, just interacting with them. And I, I was so taken aback because. Uh, you really would never know how far these messages are going. But more importantly, when it hits home, that's a real plus for me. So I want to thank everyone that supports me. On the way back here, uh, we had to overnight in Nassau before we came to Freeport. And the hotel that we stayed at, Comfort Suites in Paradise Island, uh, I met Miss Brown, yes, I think it's Regina. I think I, I could get the first name wrong, but please forgive me. And immediately she recognized who I was and, and said to me that her mother watches me all the time and she could hear my voice from her mother's room where she's constantly watching the videos. And these are common stories that I hear. But here was the kicker for me, though. Here was the kicker because I've spoken to so many people while they're in Houston who actually follows this ministry. But the thing that really, really stood out to me was the amount of men, <laughs> the amount of men that follow this ministry. I, When I tell you I was shocked, I've had wives admit it to me. In front, some of them, they turned their husband on to me. And now they can't get him from in front of the television where he's watching 24-7. I've met several men who insist that they get a photo with me as proof, you know, and they were so uh, appreciative of what I was saying and the the authenticness in what I say. And, and particularly, this again was a common thread amongst everyone that I met. I love the way that you back up everything that you say with scripture. Like your whole message is about the scriptures. I love the way you point us back to the scriptures, point us back to God. You're consistent. One lady that I met, she said, I've been following you from you first started. And what I love also is that your message remained, like you're consistent. There's no diverting. You're sticking to the scriptures. Uh, another one that I love, compliment that is, uh, I've had a few folks tell me this. They said, I have literally made them, through the teachings, fall in love with the Bible. So one of them I asked, I said, well, how, how was I able to do that? And she said, the way that you break down the scriptures and really pull the revelation out of it, it makes you want to go and seek for more. 
and 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 I thought I was listen. I don't think you would ever uh, know how rewarding that is for me. No amount of money or precious whatever could supplement for the joy that that brings to me. Because to me, I I feel within my well, I'm, well I wouldn't say I feel because I always felt this that way, but it's I'm more confident that it's then. And it's confirmed, that's what I want to use, that people are getting it. Really, people are getting it. I had one lady said to me, she cannot get her husband to go to church at all, but he will sit down and listen to my messages all day. And not to mention the with those statements coming towards the end of their conversation, how much through their practicing of the laws and rules that I consistently point out, has brought tremendous changes to their lives. So like I share with my audience all the time, if you're a man or woman of God, and whatever it is that you claim God has called you to do, there must be some fruit to back that up. We must see something producing from what you're doing to encourage at minimum us to continue with what you're saying or what you're trying to do, all right? And that is very important to me Fruit is a major thing to me, and I am convinced, and this is why I say it so much, that fruit will come about only as a result. I'm talking about the genuine fruits of God. When we implement those rules, when we implement those laws, that is key. I've been to church all my life, and all my life we jumped around, we shouted, we screamed, we gave our neighbors high five, we had the hype motivational messages, the, the the encouraging messages, but there was no rule or law that I was given or anyone else for that matter that we were not able to go and work on to bring about the manifestation. So what I got all my life was <clears throat> the trembling of voices and gee, God is getting ready to do and that stuff. And so we jump, we hype, and then we make declaration. I am a believer. I shall receive. I decree and I declare. Well, what this ministry has proven, that all of that is a whole heap of nonsense if you are not implementing the rules. Let me be clear here. (laughs) I got to be crystal because people get offended and they think I'm trying to come down on the church or throw shade, and it's none of the above. People hate the facts. The facts are, I could stand up right here after a super sermon I just heard that never instructed me what to do, but only told me who I am, what my worth is, who I am, and all of this stuff that has no root. When I say root, there's nothing that I need to do to cause this to happen. All I have to do is stand up, and decree, and to declare, and shout, and scream, and jump, and do all of that other stuff. So once all of that is already calmed down, I'm back to square one again. And that is not what I teach you. I teach you the laws, the rules. Forget Kevin. It doesn't matter how you feel about me. Just follow those biblical rules. And that's why I say to you, I didn't write the Bible. They're not my rules. Follow these rules, and watch Watch these things come to pass. So let me give you an example of what I'm saying right now with the declarations, the jumping around, the motivational speeches, the screaming, the shouting, the speaking in tongues, blah, blah, blah. Or or, Listen to me carefully, and I know you're going to be offended, and that's your problem. All of that is rubbish. All of that is foolishness. The jumping, the screaming, it makes you a a gymnast. You are an acrobat. You're, you're, you're doing exercises. That's it. If you fail to implement the rule. So here's the example. Okay. Let's say, all right, I want to teach you to bake a cake. I'm a preacher. I want to teach you to bake a cake, right? So I'm going to give you the sermon. So for me, one like me, what I'm expecting or my expectations are, this guy is going to give me a sequence of rules or some ingredients on how to mix it, how to measure. That's what I'm getting. But this is what we get from our average church. Remember now, the sermon is entitled, uh, 
baking the cake, <laughs> all right? Now, it's going to be funny, but I want you to see the seriousness in what I'm saying. So I'm the preacher. Ah, today's message is how shall I get my cake? And of course, the pianist is just going to do the little thing there and the little music in the background. That's right. That's right. You heard me. How how am I going to bake my cake? Now, now you see that there, there, there is some lemon cake. There's some chocolate cake. Uh huh. And there is some cherry cake. Come on now. Work with me. And, 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 and the cake, come on now, is to make you a better person. So people start screaming, yes, yes, go, Pastor, go, go, go. Amen, hallelujah, go. Mm -hmm. Come now, now, come now, because I don't want this to go over your head. Listen very carefully. Here is the revelation. Okay, watch this now. You got your chocolate cake, uh-huh. You got your carrot cake, uh-huh. And you got your lemon cake, uh-huh. Watch this now. At the ending of each one of these cakes is the word cake. Watch this now. And there is a C on the chocolate cake, uh-huh, and there is a C on the carrot cake. Come on now. But there is an L, uh-huh, on the lemon cake. Come on now. So we have a consistency of C's. So that means there's some people, come on now, who you could gel with the C's, but you got to dismiss the L's. Come on now. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? Listen carefully. So people start to scream because, again, I'm being comical, but again, get the seriousness of what I'm saying. So we're screaming, Pastor, Pastor, preach it. My God, this man is, this a man of wisdom. Hey, Jesus, Lord, hallelujah, preach it. Come on now, calm down now, calm down now, calm down. So when we eat the cake, oh, calm down now, listen. When we eat the cake, mm -hmm, the C category, remember carrot cake, uh-huh, chocolate cake, uh-huh, but the lemon cake is by itself. Uh -huh. When we eat the cake, come on now, there is a joy mm -hmm, that's going to come with eating that cake. Come on now. But the lemon cake by itself may eat the cake, but cannot celebrate like the chocolate and the carrot. Come, can I, can I get a witness? So people go off, start running out foolishness. Pastor, come back and say, now for those who get it, let me hear you say, I want my carrot cake. And you come along, I want my carrot for, for those in the back with the chocolate cake. Let me hear you say, I want my chocolate cake. Oh, hallelujah. I feel it right now. Uh, now for those who understand the separation between the chocolate and the lemon, the carrot and the lemon, let me hear you say, I don't want no lemon cake. Pasta, I don't want no lemon cake. Now let's stop right there. The message was, how do I bake or make my cake or whatever? What instructions were you given in this articulate, fancy speech just now? None. What were you given though? Hype, motivational speech, uh, articulation of words. But at the end of this, and this is why I tell you, you got to cut tradition. At the end of that, when church is out and you go about your business and you run into one of your friends and they say, say and you're going to tell them, child, you should have been to church today here. Yeah? Why? Why? Pastor put it down today. Pastor give some revelation. Let me tell you something. I mean, out of this world. See, that's why you don't. You should come to church and you would get, okay, so t I tell you what, I didn't come to church, so tell me what these revelations are. And just maybe it will encourage me to come to church. Pastor, talk about the cake. Now, I know this can fly over here, and I know you can try to be funny, Kevin, but just listen. And Pastor was making the comparison, and he was saying, if you want to bake the cake, there's going to be the chocolate, and there's going to be the carrot, and there's the lemons, which start with an L. But the revelation is the C for the carrot, the C for the chocolate, and at the end of it, a CC, carrot cake, chocolate cake. Two cc's, right? But the lemon cake is LC. So you got to separate yourself. No scriptures, no rules, no biblical laws, no biblical principles. But to them, they feel that they gain something. 
So now they're going to tell you, that's why me, I, I declare and right now, I shall have my cake. I shall not, and pastor say, be specific. I shall have my carrot cake. I shall have my chocolate cake, chocolate cake and carrot cake. I'm going to decree and declare. I'm going to speak it out loud. The equivalent to that, my friend, is simply this. All right? You send your child to college. And unbeknownst to you, the child isn't attending college. So if they're not attending college, they're not getting the instructions from their professors or instructors as to whatever it is they're supposed to be studying. That child will be a fool to think that at the end of that semester or whatever, they could go in their room and kneel out and pray, Father, Heavenly Father, I didn't go to class. And I duck school and I didn't, I don't know what they taught there, but I decree right now by the blood of Jesus that I will get an A if I go and set that exam. I decree an A right now in the name of Jesus. I decree, I declare, and I start jumping up and doing my jumping jacks and all this other foolishness. Do you think I will get an A because I decreed, but choose not to follow the instructions? I'm listening. So what I say to you people over and repeatedly, and you're probably tired of me saying it, the Bible is a book of laws. The Bible is a book of rules. The Bible is the constitution for the seen and the unseen realm, or the visible and, invi the visible and invisible world. It is these rules that will determine what my destiny would be if I follow them or do not follow them. They can work against me or they can work for me. But at the end of the day, when the dust is all settled, nobody is doing anything to me. Whatever happens to me, good or bad, curses or blessings, death or life, it came as a result of the rules. Whether I ignorantly engaged in a rule to my detriment or I knowingly engage in a rule to bless me. But I cannot dismiss the rules and then pop up anywhere and make a declaration and the rules supposed to kick in for me. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. The Bible also is a book of prevention as well as it is a book of cures. It is to prevent me from the evil and the troubles or at minimum mitigate it or lessen it. If I follow the rules, I will have a less impact on me, the evil of this world. If I choose not to follow the rules, then I need to go to the same Bible to find the cure or the remedy to fix my situation. In my case, I train you to see it as a preventative and to avoid seeking a cure if you follow the rules. So we cannot succumb to the fruitless rituals anymore. We cannot, the screaming, the shouting, and there's no substance, there's no root, there's no rule, there's no law. We have all throughout pulpits in modern day society, activists, that's what I call them, activists. They're not preachers and teachers of the word anymore. They're motivational speakers, they, they, they get people hype but there's no root, there is no substance, there's nothing that you could walk away with and say, let me rule that is, because you could walk away with carrot cake foolishness. But there's no rule biblically that I, that I was given. Okay, let me practice this. So my portion in the conference, I spoke about uh, poverty and being poor and really breaking it down as usual to show the difference between a person who's poor and a person who has a, a poverty mindset, because they're, they're different, they're not the same. Being poor and being in poverty is two different things. Poor is a, is a temporary position if you choose to, meaning that that could change to you being rich by an inheritance, uh, by winning the lottery, by someone blessing you, or someone just walking into your life and changing everything financially for you. That's moving you from the position of once being poor to being rich. But even in that case, being rich physically doesn't make you rich mentally because you could have a change in position from poor to being rich, but you still have a poverty mentality. 
A poverty mentality is a stronghold on a person's mind that no matter how their situation changes for the better, they still operate as if they're poor. But again, I ain't going to go into that tonight. I'm not talking about that. All right? So I'm going to tell you more about that. On Saturday, I'm uh, beginning a series on poverty and being poor. In fact, I just concluded earlier today the first session of it that I'll be discussing on my radio show on Saturday from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. Bahamas time. And I strongly advise you that you join me. All right? Now, today, I'm going to... As you know, before I left to go to Houston, I went to Houston first. And when I was done with my teaching on Friday afternoon, I had to take a flight the following morning. I was up from 3 a.m. because my flight was at 6, sorry, 6.30, quarter to 7, sorry. I had to go into Atlanta. I had another meeting there, a conference there, sorry, that I was a guest speaker. And I dealt with unforgiveness among the saints. Uh, that was phenomenal. Uh, it wasn't recorded. So what I plan to do, because it is such an impacting teaching, I am going to reteach that probably on the weekend sometime, probably Sunday or, or something like that. So because you need to hear it. It's a very, very powerful, impactful teaching. Anyway, so today I'm going to continue my series that I, I, I was doing prior to me going. And that series was The Mystery Behind Evil Altars. So for those of you on YouTube, if you type in The Mystery Behind Evil Altars by Pastor Kevin L. Ewing, it will bring up the playlist on everything that I've done so far. And today, or tonight actually, because it's approximately, it's 11, 19 p.m. here in, in the Bahamas. So tonight, as you would see my topic, we're dealing with evil altars and dreaming of the dead. This is going to be so powerful, so impactful, so informative. This is something that you have to hear. And I, as usual with my teaching, I'm going to give you the rules. <laughs> I, I, I never get, my opinion means nothing. Just like any other preacher, they are, their opinion means zero, unless that opinion is in line with scripture. Outside of that, I don't care to hear you. I don't care to hear your logic, your hypothesis, your ideology, your conjecture. All of that brings confusion. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear your narrative if it is not in line with the scriptures. Kevin is a scripture man. In other words, I am a spiritual lawyer. So when I come to the courtroom, okay, I come in to address my case with the law that's going to back me which are the scriptures. My opinion doesn't matter. All right? So again, the series you'll find on YouTube in my playlist, just type in the mystery behind evil altars. And of course, this particular teaching tonight is evil altars and dreaming of the dead. So before I start, I want to share uh, two dreams that I've had with you. I've had multiple dreams about deceased loved ones and deceased people on the whole. But two dreams that stand out very clear to me because they were so vivid. And the reason why I'm harping on these two, because once I'm done with telling you it, I'm going to tell you during that time of my life what was happening that will show you the correlation between the dream and my real life. Okay? So one night, many years ago, I had this dream. And in this dream, my deceased grandmother on my mother's side, she was in this dream. And it's like she was in this room that appeared to be like a hospital room, right? Even though the environment itself didn't look like a hospital. And the only thing I would say attributed to me calling it a hospital was the bed that she was in was a hospital bed, you know, where it could recline and all that other stuff. Anyway, she was lying down in the bed with her back to the bed, who would have you. And at first it appears as if she was dead. Now remember, she's dead in real life. At that time, she's, she was deceased in reality. So I was standing by the door, and there was this nurse in there. And it was like, I can't remember if the nurse was trying to resuscitate her or help her or whatever. But as I was walking in, 
the nurse was coming out and she had this very evil smirk on her face. So when I walked up to the bed that my grandmother was in, she literally looked dead in the, in the bed. But again, remember, she's deceased in reality. Okay? So all of a sudden, she got up, almost like a, like a robot. Her, her, her lower torso didn't move. That stayed in the bed, but she got up like from the, 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 the base of her back up. She just got up straight up. And she turned to me just like this. And all of a sudden, there was this paper that she handed me, and she signed it and gave me this paper, and she went back down again. So I took the paper. Well, before I, I kind of go in ahead of myself, remember I told you when the nurse was coming out, she had like this smirk on her face. What I didn't remember to tell you was, even in the dream, it seemed as if this was a setup or something being staged, right? Anyway, so back to where I was. So I took this paper that she signed, and I walked out the way that I came in. And immediately when I walked out, immediately to my left, there was a staircase, very steep staircase. So I'm walking, walking, but I remember holding this white sheet of paper. I never read what was on it. None of that. I, I walked, walked, walked. It was quite a distance until I got to the top of the staircase and the dream ended. I woke up that morning, you know, I rebuked it. I knew that back then I, I did that and so on. But for some reason that the dream meant much more. Anyway, I'll get back to that. A second dream I had, I dreamt how I was at my old residence. Uh, this was before I met Deidre, right? I was at my old residence and the room that I was, that I, that my bedroom at the time, there was a rear window that faced the side of the yard. And we had a nice coconut tree, short coconut tree, this reality, and this was exactly what was in the dream. So when I look carefully leaning on the fence with its box facing me was my deceased brother. I have a brother that died yet many years ago, right? He was right after me. So in fact, he would have been 50 this month, May 24th. Anyway, and in the dream, he, he was, he did look so nice. He was extremely handsome, well-dressed. And I remember him turning around. He had on a pair of a, a denim jeans pants with a nice shirt. And I watched him. They were like some other people in the yard. I didn't know who they were. I didn't even pay attention to them because I was so in awe of him. But remember, in reality, back then, he's deceased. But in the dream, he's alive. So he walks up to the window. And in a very calm voice, he says to me, you can keep the $10 that you have for me. Now, the reality, the reality is I didn't owe this man no money. In, re, in, in, in reality, I never owed him no money. But again, I'm so uh, taken in by him being alive. And he looked so nice, smooth skin. He was a bright guy, round face. And he just looked so peaceful. And... Prior to that, though, sorry, prior to that, before he turned around, I could remember there being like this doll on the ground. But the doll was like a dirty doll, and it just seemed to be sinister there. And remember, I told you there were some people in the yard, but I didn't really recognize them. But the truth is, they, even though I'm saying they were people, the, what I should be saying is there was a lot of movement that appear to be people, but really like midgets. But I couldn't make them out. But again, the reason was because I was so focused on my brother. So when he said what he said, he turned back around and he headed towards the fence and I woke up out of the dream. Again, I woke up and at that time, I didn't know much about the rebuking, but I knew it wasn't a good dream. Okay, so during those times of my life, both cases, I was going as usual through these heavy witchcraft attacks, right? Now, I knew back then that dreaming of the dead wasn't good. Now, I knew that part of it. To the extent of dreaming about the dead and the spiritual implications that comes along with it, I, I wasn't aware of any of that. I didn't know, but I, I knew these dreams weren't well. 
And so my thoughts were, why would my grandmother who's deceased, why would my brother who's deceased come to me in my dream? Why would my grandmother give me a paper that she had signed? Okay? And it's like I knew what to do with it. And I walk up these stairs in a dream. I don't know where I'm going. I don't even know why I took it. Why didn't I read it? What? So tonight, and that's why I gave you those two dreams, I am going to help you understand dreams when you're consistently, in particular, dreaming about deceased people, loved ones, friends, strangers, enemy, whomever, anyone that does not exist as a human anymore, they have already expired and they moved on to eternity. Excuse me, and you're having dreams about them. I'm going to, excuse me, reveal to you what the spiritual significance of that is, and it is never good. Let's be clear from the onset. Any dream where you're dreaming about your deceased loved ones, family, friends, whoever, once the person is deceased, they are evil, demonic, wicked, destiny-changing dreams. Let me let that marinate just a little bit. They're not good. And I've taught on this many times. I've wrote a lot of articles on it, but tonight I'm going to go even further into the revelation and the understanding of these deceptive, evil, wicked dreams. And immediately when you have those dreams, you need to rebuke those dreams and reject it because you're coming in covenant with demons and evil spirits. Okay? Okay. All right. The ultimate sign that an evil altar is operating against you. One of the initial signs, the most common, most frequent sign is the consistent dreaming of dead people or deceased people. Where do you dream it every night? Where do you dream it twice a month, once a month? Where do you dream it every week? If your dreams are saturated with deceased people, make no mistake, I don't care who you are, there is an evil altar operating against your life. Make no mistake. And I can jump ahead of myself. Let me jump ahead of myself. I, I can do this part. <clears throat> Every dream that you have of a deceased person, and depending on their behavior, their action, or what they're doing to you, or whatever, is, is what that evil altar is specifically coming at you in terms of trying to shut down in your life. Make it make sense, Kevin. Okay, let's say you had a dream, and in this dream, your deceased mother, father, whoever, came to you and gave you money. And as far as you're concerned, because more than likely that dream would come, primarily too, because you, you, you are in financial need. So you took the money and you felt good because you figured this my Grammy and she always loved me. I was her favorite or whatever, whatever. So you, you, you trusted whom you thought was your Grammy. But what you didn't know is when you took it, because remember, you taking that money in the dream is in the physical you. The physical you is asleep. And the spirit you, the spirit and soul part of you is interacting in the spiritual realm with another spirit. But the spirit who is masquerading or disguised or incognito as your deceased relatives, which is known as a familiar spirit. I'm jumping ahead of myself. The spirit being familiar, meaning that it's, it, it knows or it's familiar with your family, with you. It knows that you were the favorite of this deceased loved one. So it's coming in that form and fashion to win the trust of the dreamer. Once the dreamer accepts what is being offered in the dream from the spirit to a spirit, which is the person accepting it, a covenant is forged, which now gives that spirit, which is more than likely a spirit of poverty, the right to operate in this person's life. Now, this shouldn't be a shocker to you because I gave you the biblical backing behind this, and I will share it again tonight in uh, 1 Kings chapter 3 from verses 1 to 5. Solomon just did this huge sacrifice unto God a thousand animals. And it says, that night, the Spirit of God visited Solomon in a dream. And he said, Solomon, what would you have me to do? Solomon said, well, in a long story short, I want wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to lead your people. 
the spirit of God said to the spirit of Solomon, behold, because you did not ask me for long life, riches, or the life of your enemy, I have given you what you've requested. But how did you get it in the dream? Kevin, are you suggesting to us, your students, that a person could be given something spiritually in a dream and it manifests in real life? Well, not me telling you this. The Bible tells you this. Because the wisdom and knowledge that Solomon asked for in the dream was given to him, given to him in a dream, and it manifested in his real life when he had to make the judgment between the two prostitutes and one of them who uh, accidentally killed their child and tried to lie, said the one, the living child of the other prostitute was theirs. So that is a principle that while I'm accepting stuff in the dream, don't just chalk it up that this is a dream, don't worry about it. No, 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 no. Depending on the contents and context of that dream, you clearly receiving from a spirit, but the spirit from where though? Is it the kingdom of darkness or is it the kingdom of light? Because whichever one you grab a hold of or went along with their instructions or took whatever from them, that gave the covenant that was needed by that spirit based on spiritual law for that spirit to facilitate its good or its evil in the life of the victim in the dream. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. We're going deep tonight. I ain't playing with y'all no more. I tired of this foolishness. <laughs> we going deep. All right? So when that masquerading demon who was pretending to be my grandmother signed whatever and gave it to me and I took it that could have been my death. That could have been a, a, a contract of poverty, insanity, depression. I had no idea, but I took it. I took Because to me, that's my grandmother, even though she's deceased. And I'm walking up these stairs with whatever this is. Don't know where I'm going. Don't know what's on this contract. Don't know anything. My brother, who's deceased and gone, been gone. Well over 20 years at that point. And he comes to me and says, you could keep. And I agreed, I will keep the $10 or whatever. Even though I don't owe him any money. These evil spirits, are all they want to know. You clearly believe this is your brother. How you're responding to me. How you took this from me. Boom, that seals the covenant that that spirit needed. Remember what I told you in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 28. When God completed creating this earth, he's now about to hand over the keys to who will be the landlords of this planet. And that would have been mankind, which Adam and Eve represented. So God says, come here, Adam and Eve. And he blessed them and gave them dominion and so on over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and over every creeping thing that creeped upon this earth. Excuse me. In uh, Psalms 8, verses 4 to 6, he says, For what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou art visit of him, visits him. For he has crowned him a little lower than the angels. But God has given him dominion or power over all the works of his hand. So in a nutshell, God says, come here, Adam and Eve. You're going to represent mankind. And I'm giving you the authority over this planet. Who did he not give authority to? He didn't give it to spirits. None. Hence, altars back in the Old Testament time, had to have been erected and following certain rituals to summons the spirit at the altars, where the ritual will now be the, the uh, protocol to follow to get the cooperation of the spirit. The spirit couldn't come haphazardly into the earth and do whatever it wanted to do. It had to go through this, medi this medium, which is the altars, to make sacrifices, and so on, to bring the spirit and now advise it as to what we want it to do. So now you see when an altar is raised, the first, the first signs to the victim, they're going to be flooded with dreams of the deceased. Either that or sexual dreams. Oven repeatedly. Depending on the intensity of what is being done at that altar against them, will determine the intensity of the dreams. I'm trying to help you. Let me, let me sit up here. I'm trying to help you. 
So the ultimate sign that an evil altar is operating against you would be the consistent dreaming of the dead. This is one of the primary uh, factors. This is how I know there's an evil altar. Now, one would say, okay, Kevin, I, I, I think I'm following you so far. But I haven't went to no altar, so I don't think nobody's working. I mean, nobody have time for me. Right, because what you're thinking about now is that, yes, you did not go to a physical altar where people are walking around with black robes and hoodies and, and singing and chanting and so on. You could have done something <laughs> as simple, and people don't realize this, and I'm going to talk more on this in my coming teachings. Sometimes nobody went to an altar for you. In fact, you went and contacted an altar for yourself. Oh boy, Kevin, you better make it make sense. You better make it make sense, Kevin. You're trying to tell me, Kevin, I volunteered for an altar to work against me? Yes, but you didn't know. But make it make sense, Kevin. You see, any form of sorcery, divination, witchcraft, uh, anything of that nature, serving other gods, and that's why I keep talking about pledges to these different deities and Greek gods, all of this is the conveyor belt of sorcery. All of this, no matter how it's presented to you, had to have been, because of the rules, established by an altar. So what does this mean? If you had your palms read through tarot card reading, through psychics, or you went to somebody who could delve into the future, every one of these people, no matter how they come at you, no matter how they label themselves, spiritual mother, whatever, in order for them to have those powers, they had to have consulted an altar. In order to pair into the spiritual realm, which they're doing illegally, if it's not true to the Lord, then they had to have had some... So the, the truth is, the minute you made contact with them, for whatever reason, listen to me carefully, by default, you have opened up yourself to evil altars. By default. If you, based on what I'm telling you now, if you could even go back in your mind, for those of you who visited these people or engage in any of this stuff, doing sage in your house, uh, interpreting omens, uh, there are folks, uh, uh, their, their, their stuff where Grammy and Daddy tell you to do to rub on your skin, to go in the ocean and dip seven times so the spirits don't come after you, put salt in your place, mop your floor type in time. Uh, all of these weird remedies, these are all rituals. And them, like yourself, are engaging ignorantly in a ritual that is inviting a spirit from that particular altar. What do you mean that particular Because each ritual is summonsing a specific spirit from a specific altar, but you don't know this. So when they said to you, listen, you want to keep spirits out of your house? Okay, first thing in the morning, urine in a basin and put that urine in, and your urine in front of your door or go around your house with some sea water and pour into the borders of your property or your house itself, or sweep in the front of your door in the morning so that whatever they put there spiritually will not affect you. Well, the truth is, you're literally, wow, you're literally engaging in a ritual that's inviting a spirit from the altar. So watch this. You didn't go and work witchcraft. You didn't summon a spirit knowingly. You that I, this is what mommy did. This is what papi did. This is what my aunt told me. And she never had any blah, blah, blah in her house. Yeah, but what they didn't tell you, though, these were omens. And omens simply means that you were following rituals unknowing to you that invited evil altars in your life. They couldn't come in your life haphazardly. That's why I love the rules of scripture. The spiritual law dictates that there must be a medium. There must be an agreement then between human and spirits for that spirit to have the right to come and harass me or whoever, or do their bidding. So you see now, it's all going to make sense going forward. Nothing is happening to you because it could happen. Again, the Bible is a book of laws. The Bible is a book of rules. 
The Bible is a the book, is, a, is, the, is the constitution that speaks to the invisible realm as well as the physical realm. So this is why I start off kind of comically in the beginning that the jumping around and so on and change, that means nothing. The screaming, the speaking, that means nothing. If you insist on not discovering and following the rules, because it's the rules that you're fighting with. Can you imagine as powerful as hell is right now and the biggest sinner on this planet the hordes of hell cannot just jump on that person because they're a sinner and destroy their lives. Why? Because of the laws, the rules, and the principles that even that person don't even know about. So this is why for me, I don't care about your screaming, about your fancy preaching, about your seed sowing, about your garbage. I need the rules, somebody. Give me the rules. I will practice that. Let me practice this. Because of this God's law, this cannot return unto me void. If this God's law, well, heaven and earth will pass away before one jot of this will not come to pass. If this God's law, his word, he says he's placed his word above his name. So this is why I say to you, I love rules, scriptural rules. I love the law, scriptural laws. I love principles, scriptural principles. Because you could label yourself, however, I am the big honcho from the satanic kingdom of the underworld. Okay, so what? The rules apply to you also. So if I don't have any evil in my life, if I am not practicing evil and not, and have, oh, sorry, unconfessed sin, I don't care how big and bad you are, Mr. King of the Satanic Kingdom. You cannot touch me. Why? Because the law, which is God's word, says, Proverbs 26, verse 2b, the curse without a cause, the hex, the spells, the voodoo, the incantation being projected to Kevin, the curse causeless, meaning there's no reason, there's no cause for it to come to Kevin. Kevin is doing what is right because he understands the law. The curse causes cannot come. At best, they could peep and look and hope that Kevin sins and don't confess it. So this is why I say to you again, <laughs> I, I got nothing against sowing seeds, you know. I say to you all the time, I have no problem with sowing seed and, and all this. My problem is when you're using this to replace the law. That's the problem. Sowing seed to a preacher cannot stop a demon that have the right to oppress you. If you are living in sin, no matter how much seed you give that church, no matter how much seed you give that preacher, no matter how much declarations you make, no, much, no matter how much chandolo, mandolo, bam, 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 all of that garbage, that the demon is laughing and I'm laughing along with him against you because you're doing foolishness. And it is a clear indicator to me, you do not know the rules. You don't, because if you, if you did... You would never be doing the nonsense you're doing. You would insist, let me, what, okay, what does the, what did the Bible say about this? What are the, how, how, what laws am I not implementing that is causing this evil to come upon me? No. You've turned the house of God into money changes. But anyway, that's a different story, right? So right now, here's what we're going to do, because I've broken down this teaching into a few segments. And the first one we're going to look at is the biblical principles of a dead person or the deceased. Let's see. Again, I don't want to hear your opinion. I don't care to hear it. I'm not going to entertain you. Never. Unless it's lined up with the scriptures. So I'm going to give you principles from the Bible. Rules that govern afterlife or when a person is dead. All right, because what this rules is going to show me now, give me a heads up, that if a person is dead, based on the rules, there are certain things that cannot happen despite popular belief, despite people's opinion, despite their whatever. I've had people say to me, Kevin, I've listened to your teaching. I've read many of your articles. And you said that the dead know nothing. I, I beg to differ. 
people. You could beg to differ. You could beg to miffer or whatever you want beg to do. I know what the scripture says. And they said to me, well, I dreamt about my deceased grandmother and my mommy or whatever, and their things that they told me in the dream, and it came to pass. Okay, so what does that mean? I'm just proving to you that I know it was her, and she's looking down from heaven, and she's protecting me. Okay, well, if that's the case, then why she couldn't protect herself from death? Why she couldn't stop? If she was so protective, why couldn't she protect herself? But that's a different story. So let's look at some principles, okay? Let's look at some principles. So let's go to Deuteronomy. I love scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 18, and we're going to look at verse 11, all right? And these were some practices that God told Israel not to participate in, all right? But actually, let's start from verse 9. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 9 says, When thou art come into the land, meaning the promised land, Canaan, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not highlight that. Thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations. That's what these things I'm about to read of those nations. Do not do of these abominations that the Canaanites were doing. There shall not be found among you anyone that make it a son or his daughter to pass through the fire. Do not sacrifice your children. Or that use a divination communicating with evil spirits, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch. Don't be doing none of those things. Or a charmer, or a consultant with familiar spirits. That's going to be key. But that ain't the part we're looking at. Or a wizard, but this is the part I'm going to focus on. Or a necromancer. Who, who is a necromancer? Well, it's a sorcery term, and the word necromancer literally means someone who claims to communicate with the deceased. So the first biblical principle in regards to dead people is where our Lord, those who serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all right, is saying to his people, that will include us today also, don't ever let it be named or identified among any of you so-called believers that you're communicating with the dead. Because as we're about to read, that is impossible. It cannot happen. So the next question should be, but then who was it in pretending to be my deceased loved one when I went to Spiritus, Mother Teresa, whatever her name is, or whoever else? And she said that Mama's looking down and Mama said everything is going to be okay. And Mama said that that teddy that I gave you when you were six years old, because it's a familiar spirit. The word familiar in the Hebrew means to know. They're aware. And just to know that this is your mama. Remember, I gave you the teddy bear with the red nose. <laughs> yes, I believe that's mama, because only mama would know that. Mama in the familiar spirit. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to assist you, okay? So the first principle is, you, anyone who tell you or say to you that they could contact your deceased loved ones is a devil. Okay, they are from the kingdom of darkness, and that is what they represent. All right, let's look at a second principle of the dece- of the deceased or dead people. So, let's go to Ecclesiastes, my favorite one. I love this one. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter nine. Mm-hmm. I'm going to read verse five to verse six. Listen carefully to what it says. These are rules. That's why I love laws. I'm not interested in nobody's opinion. The minute you come in with your opinion, I am done listening to you. I have nothing to say to you anymore. Excuse me. You're not going to pollute my what I read. No. Ecclesiastes 9, the principle of the dead. Verse 5. For the living, that's you and I, know or we are aware that we will die one day. But, very clear, The dead, or those who are deceased, who don't exist anymore, knows nothing. They they don't know squat what's happening over here. Just like how we don't know what's going on on that side, they know nothing over here. These are scriptural laws. This is not my opinion. This is not how I feel. This is none of that. So you could go wherever with that garbage. Get that foolishness over here. The dead is unaware, wherever they are, 
they have no knowledge, as we're about to read further, of what's happening on this earth, as well as we have no knowledge of what's happening over there. So he says, for the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Listen, neither, the writer's continuing now, about more principles about the dead, neither have they any more a reward. Uh Uh-huh. For the memory of them is forgotten. Who are we talking about? Who's the subject here? The the, the deceased, the dead. But I love verse 6 because it gets even more, gives more detail of the principle of those who have passed on already. Verse 6 of Ecclesiastes 9 says, Also, their love, who's this there? The deceased. Their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. It has come to an end. Neither, he's going on with more, have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Okay, good. So, now either God is a liar or he's a God of truth. So if the scripture just explicitly explained to me that when a person is deceased, Whatever emotion, feeling, whoever they owe, who owed them, whatever the case may be, once they are deceased, all of that comes to an end. There's no more communication with them. They have no more portion under the sun. They cannot come from the dead, whether it's in our dream or in reality. They cannot come as an apparition and say, oh, this is your daddy, Kevin. I, I, am, I, I am dead, but I'm showing up here to let you know that I'm watching over you. Garbage, because the scriptures are unequivocally clear. The dead is just that. They are dead. They know nothing. (sighs) Okay, Cameron. I got you. So who was it showing up in my dream as my deceased loved one? Because I believe the Bible. And according to that Bible, as much as I love Papa, Grumpy, as much as I love them, as tight as our relationship was, your 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 ex husband, sorry, your deceased husband, your deceased wife, and you you spent forty years together, and the majority of those years were super, that you almost want to relive them again, and you miss them so much. Let me be clear to you, and I'm not being insensitive. They have no more right to this planet. As well as long as you are living, you have no right to the other side. The Bible said their memory is done. You cannot come bring them back. That's it. That's the way God set it up. Not being harsh, not being difficult. I'm giving you straight facts from the scriptures. It's not my opinion. So the script, so, so the question is, well, who could this be? And we, we're going to get there. Let's let's look at some more rules. Let's look at some more rules. Let's look at Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. Okay? And it's talking about death and what happens afterwards and so on, right? So listen to what it says. It says, then shall the dust, this is when a person die, return to the earth. So you, this flesh, remember God breathed into man that he made from the dust and he became a living soul. So he says, then shall the dust, that's this flesh, return to the earth, meaning you're going to go back to the grave, and run away, as it was, meaning where you came from, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So the spirit, which is the life of God, goes back to God. The flesh, which is the dust, goes back to the ground. But the soul, though, (laughs) that's a different story. That's the one that either will go into eternity with God or eternity with the kingdom of darkness. And again, that's a different teaching, but I'm just giving you more, more facts here. So, If the flesh goes back to the ground and rot away, returns to dust, and the spirit goes back to to God. So that's a done deal. God ain't reversing nothing up, and yet that's a done deal in terms of this earth that is. So again, if this is the case what you're reading, then again, who is this showing up in our dream as our deceased friends or loved ones or whoever? Let's look at some more spiritual laws. Let's look at what Job have to say about life after death. So let's go to Job 14. See, I like to give facts. Job chapter 14, here we go, Job 14, and we're going to read from verse 10 to verse 12, and listen to what he says. Job chapter 14, beginning of verse 10, 
all the way to verse 12. But man died and wasted away. In other words, he goes back to the dust. Yea, man giveth up the ghost, which would have been his spirit. We just read it in Ecclesiastes 12 and 7. And where is he? Verse 11 of Job 14. As the waters fail from the sea, and the flood decayeth and dry it up, so man lieth down and riseth not. So he says, when you dead, ain't no more coming up. Until though, watch this. So man lieth down and riseth up till the heavens be no more. So meaning that when God comes to judge, that's why the Bible says, appointed unto man wants to die. And after that, there's a judgment. The new heavens, new and all that stuff. Well, that's when we need to see you again because you got to not give an account for what you did in this body. Sinner or saint. <laughs> okay. So he says, so lie it, man, so lie it down. Verse 12 of Job 14. And rise it not till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. The Bible is tell you no human being that has passed on will return back here until the time of the judgment. Drop to verse 14 of Job 14. What does it say? If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change comes. So again, more not just empirical evidence, but when I'm reading it, remember what I keep putting this in your head. The Bible is a book of laws and rules and principles. It's not just stories. In every story of the Bible, from Ruth, Naomi, Gideon, Joshua, Moses, Isaac, whoever, every one of, one of those stories, the undertone of every one, or embedded in every story are the laws and rules and principles of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord God Almighty. The purpose of this story, these stories is to show you those when they did it God way, they got a God result. Those when they rebelled or went against the laws of God and the penalties that would accompany them, it's now playing out in these people's lives, as well as the reward for those who did what was they supposed to do. So what we're reading here is the rules. So if you die and you realize, hey, look, where, where am I? I'm not. I can't see my family anymore. I don't, where's this place? I don't know this place. Well, remember what I'm telling you now if you slip there tonight, that Kevin told you already, once you're over there, you don't know what's going on over here. Once you are here, you don't know what's going on over there. Now, your ticket from here to there, the protocol, you must, death must be the, the protocol for that. And all death is, in simple terms, it's the extraction of your spirit and soul from your physical body. That's when death rolls up on you. Because what makes you exist on this earth, legally that is, is this flesh which your spirit and soul is housed in. But death is the pulling away. It's the extraction of that. So this flesh goes back to the ground and rot away. And the spirit goes back to God, which gives life to all of this. And your soul goes to uh, hell or heaven. Bottom line. Facts. All right? Yeah, Kevin, I see all those Old Testament scriptures. Give it to me in the New Testament. Uh, yeah, okay, fine, no problem. <laughs> so let's go to Luke. These are principles of the deceased. Let's go to Luke. Luke chapter 16. And we're going to read from verse 19. All right? We're not going to read all of it, but I'm just giving you for reference. We're going to read from verse 19 to verse 31. Okay? There was a certain man, and, and scholars, many scholars, biblical scholars will tell you that this story here is in fact a true story. It's a true story. And they believe that the rich man name was Divius. Now, how to get to all that, I don't know, but I'm just telling you what I read, all right? So verse 19 of Luke 16 says, there was a certain man, and this is Jesus speaking. There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at the gate full of sores. At his gate, the rich man gate full of sores. Verse 21 of Luke 16. And desired, Lazarus that is, to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Okay, listen to verse 22. Because so far, based on the story, Lazarus and the rich man, are in their living state. They are not deceased. 
They are fully aware of what's happening around them. They are alive just like you and I right now. But the story is about to take a twist in verse 22 of Luke 16. And it came to pass that the beggar, uh uh-huh, beggar died, okay? Now remember we just read the rules on the principles of deceased people, right? They can't come here no more. They love, they hate, and all of that finish as it relates to this earth. They have no more participation in anything under the sun as long as they are dead. No more reward, no more punishment physically on the side that is. So verse 22 says, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. So this is beautiful. I love this story. And this isn't the only part of the Bible that this particular uh, protocol is shared. Uh, there's also, I think in Isaiah, it speaks about when a person dies in the Lord, how the angel escort them into whatever, right? Okay, verse 22, it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels, plural, into Abraham's bosom. So this would have been the place that the saints who died before Jesus Christ came on the scene, this is called paradise. This is where they would go to and be in their holding place, okay? Of course, when Jesus Christ came and died and so on, everything changed after that. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. So, so far, based on verse 22, both of these two people, the rich man and Lazarus, the poor man, have both died. One, the angels escorted into the bosom of Abraham, right? Now, let's be clear here. He he was buried. So it's talking about a spirit that was escorted there. But his physical flesh was buried. But the Bible just picking it up from where he was escorted. So I don't want you to believe that the physical dead man was escorted into the bosom of Abraham. No, that didn't happen. And I could, t- I could prove that based on the scriptures we read before. When a person died, their flesh goes back to the ground and it goes back to the dust where it came from. The spirit goes back to God, so on and so forth. So while, while the, the poor, when the poor man died, his soul, his soul now goes via the angel into Abraham's bosom. It says the rich man also died and was buried. Okay, so now they didn't say Lazarus was buried, but he was buried. So both of them were buried, and both of their bodies are uh, rotting away in the cross of the earth where they are buried. But their bodies mean nothing anymore because now their soul is in, a, in, in the reality of life, which is the spiritual realm. Because everything else you've got going on around you is just a, a show. This is just temporary. The reality of life is the afterlife. Whether you believe it or not is irrelevant because everyone will face that, right? Verse 23 says, and in hell, uh-huh, he lifted up his eyes. Now, who are they referring to? Well, let's go back to verse 22. It says, and the rich man died and was buried. And it says, now in hell, he opened up his eyes. So the, he is still existing, just like Lazarus, but they're existing in the spiritual world. I think I'm going too fast. Let me let that digest a little bit. All right? I can let that marinate just a little bit. I have to because where we're going, we're going deeper. So you're going to have to make room in your brain for more of what I'm about to pour in there right now. Okay? Okay? So listen now, because what you're about to see to prove the existence that of the afterlife, you're going to see the rich man. You're going to see a show based on the scriptures of the rich man five senses on display, even though he's not on this side of life. He's existing just like how I'm existing and you're existing right now in this physical world. Well, he is existing right now, still today, in the spiritual world. So watch this. Watch this now. Again, these are the principles of the dead. So the death, like I said, means an extraction. And it means that the, the, the one who is deceased, their shell that they had here, this physical body, that's rotting away, but they are living on the other side of life. Because as we would have read in the story, it shows their living state where they once lived like us here on the earth, but then both died 
and it's now showing the afterlife. All right. So he says here, and he lifted up his eyes, verse 23 of Luke 16, and he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. He sorry, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments with an S. There were multiple torments, not just in torment, in torments. All right. And see it, he could see. So if he in torment, excuse me. So he's, he's, he's aware of everything that's going on around him. And the Bible says he lifted up his eyes so he could see. Lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and see it Abram afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Mm -hmm. So not only could he see, he recognized Lazarus. He could, it, his cognitive skills are clearly intact. But again, he's in the spiritual world, all right? Verse 24, and he, which is the rich man, cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am torment in this flame. He could see, he could hear, he could taste, he could he could, all his five senses kicking it. Mm -hmm. He recognized cognitive skills working. He could he's an, it's still an intelligent being. You, you don't turn stupid after you die. No, you everything is in time. You're still existing. Still existing. Watch this now. Verse 25. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. Now, I love this story. I love this story because this story cements what I've always preached throughout my ministry. I am a strong proponent, a strong supporter of assisting the poor because I understand the revelation of it. No matter what I preach, how I preach it, some way, somehow I tuck that in there. The importance of helping your fellow man is going to play a major role because in this case here, it's, it's clearly displayed and played out. I am seeing nothing prior to this man's death where he was a fornicator, where he was a liar, where he was an adulterer, where he was a murderer, none of those things. Now, maybe he was those things, but, the, but listen to what I'm saying. The Bible gives no account or even record of it. From what I'm reading here, it would appear, because it's the only evidence I see, and I'm following the evidence, he is in hell because he never helped his fellow man. Lazarus, who was in need, like I've been telling you about the poor and how we must help them, Lazarus, who was in need, even though this man had more in abundance, never helped him. Never offered any help to Lazarus, this rich man. So Abraham is saying, when you had it, when you were living in your, in fact, let me read it again. But Abram, verse 25, said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thou good things. So you are blessed. God blessed you, but not just for you, but to bless you to be a blessing to others. Don't I always preach that to you? Don't I always tell you stop repeatedly giving your monies to churches and so on and help the poor? I didn't say don't give it to them. I said you should help the poor first. They're the first people you give to even before your pastor, before the church. Because when you give to the poor, you're giving to Jesus Christ according to the word of God. He said when you give it to the least of these, you are giving it to me, Jesus. So that's why many Christians are going to be shocked that on the day of judgment, they're going to say, God, why am I here? You never help the poor. Never. The monies I've blessed you with, the wealth that I've blessed you with, you've built houses, you've supported a big time, whomever, but you never gave to the man who really needed it. You never assisted other people. Same thing with this joke over here. Now, he in a place where he cannot leave, all of a sudden he want Abram to have mercy on him. But remember, this dude is dead. Let's be clear. Let's be clear. Because we could get into the story and still thinking as if he's still existing in this natural world. The devil is a liar. He ain't existing nothing. Okay, so watch this, verse 26. But Abram said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thou good things, and Lazarus likewise evil things. But now he is confident, and thou art not. You allowed the temporary things of life to fool you. Now look at you. 
those things that you had on the earth, you could not bring them with you to comfort you now. Because the physical things stay with the physical side of the world is, and the spiritual things stay with the spiritual side is. So you got to deal with this. Listen to verse 26. And besides all this, he's talking about an, uh, uh, what Lazarus is saying to this man. You had the opportunity to change your circumstances by investing in the life of Lazarus. I said to the Millions Conference, like I've been saying in so many of my teachings, the greatest investment you could ever make in your lifetime is to invest in the life of someone who could do absolutely nothing for you. The greatest revelation of that is what we're reading right now. Had this man invested and shared the blessings God gave him with people like Lazarus who truly needed it, I don't think this story would have had his name there. Verse 26 of Luke 16, and besides all this, this is, I mean, Abraham speaking to Lazarus. He says, aside from all of this, between us, there is a great gulf fix or space so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from you. In other words, he's saying, where you are, where paradise was at that time, where the saints went, there was a big, huge space between where paradise was and where the torments of hell was. So he says, even if I told Lazarus to go, he couldn't even make it over to where you are. But what is he talking about? The spiritual world. Mm. Yeah, let me let me just sit up here for a second. Put my mic up here because we're about to go a little deep right now, okay? They're trying to help you tonight. Don't, don't go to bed yet. This can get juicier right about here, okay? Watch this now. Let me bring my chair here right there. I hope you all notice my nice little setup here, my new chair and stuff. I still love this, but we ain't there today, <laughs> okay? Verse 27, then he, which is the rich man who was in torment, said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou would have sent him to my father's house. Send Lazarus to my daddy's house to warn my brothers. No, 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 boy, you, you can't hear it. Huh? You, something in your ears, eh? You can, when a person dies, everything about them has come to an abrupt halt and ended on the earth. They already bury you, boss. You are a memory, if that, boss. You don't exist up there no more, boss. Whenever they talk about you, boss, they're going to talk about you in the past tense. So watch this, verse 27. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou would have sent him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, least they also come into this place of torment. Don't let them come here. Please send Lazarus to warn them. I like how Abraham Conorak is narrative. Verse 29 of Luke 16. Abraham said unto him, <laughs> they have Moses mm -hmm. and the prophets. Let them hear them. Mm. So when I was reading the study on this, the, the commentary, this part here convinced me that this had to have been a true story. And the reason is because, and the true, and not only a true story, but this story happened in the time of Moses' era, era. Because Abraham, okay, who is deceased, because obviously he is uh, uh, Lazarus in his, his, in his bosom. This rich man who's deceased, the rich man says, send, 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 send Lazarus so he could tell me. He said, no, 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 I'm sending Lazarus nowhere. Because those who are up on the earth right now, they still have Moses, meaning Moses was still existing then. And not just Moses, watch this now, and the other prophets, let them hear them. So when I read that part, I said, okay, you know what? Forensically, I, I, I believe it. I believe it was a true story. I believe it was a true story. And even when the story started off, and Jesus said, for there was a certain man, a, a particular person 
almost being specific, like this story is true. Anyway, that's a different story. I'll look that up. So, where have we been now? So we tell them, buddy, you know what? Don't, don't, don't try that. They have the profits, just like you had the opportunities. Just how you had the opportunities to get it right, so do they. However, you choose to exercise your freedom, that is totally uh, up to you. Watch this now. That's what I'm trying to get to. Verse 29 says, Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead. <laughs> Look at this voodoo worker. <laughs> he said, <laughs> He said, <laughs> He said, listen, listen. He says, No, 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 you ain't listening, Abraham. I said to you earlier, if he if he was to go back, if he was to go back, you know, more than likely my brothers will be convinced because he's coming from the dead. So watch this now. I love this story. Verse 30 of Luke 16. And he, which is the rich man, said, Nay, or no, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And watch how Abraham come at him again. And he said unto him, meaning Abraham, if they heard not Moses, who was alive, <laughs> and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So I mean, they ain't going nowhere. So that story solidify all of the other principles I gave you on a, the principles of a deceased person. They have no affiliations with this earth. There's no such thing as your mommy or daddy or brother, whoever passed on ahead of you is coming back to revisit you. And I'm going to show you in more details right now what is actually coming at you and why you need to challenge, excuse me, such dreams. But more importantly, what is conjuring them, what is causing it uh, to happen. Now, I just told you about the laws of the deceased. I'm going to tell you about laws of altars. And I'm giving you the laws because I'm going to give you, as usual, one story that's going to encompass everything that I would have said so the entire teaching can make sense to you. So, of course, the laws of the altars are pretty clear. Exodus chapter 20, verse 24. God says, if you create an altar unto me, these are the specific things that you should do that I require. And once you would have done that, I, God, who is a spirit, you cannot see me, I will now come and visit this altar, and I will bring with me what? Blessings. So it shows you that the principle of the altar is that the, there are spirits that come to the altar who seeks permission from mankind once mankind followed the instructions that will give them the right to come to perform whatever it is that they want them to perform, right? So that's what happened to a godly altar. In 1 Kings chapter 13, I think verses 1 to 10, somewhere around there, and it speaks about this prophet who went, who was sent to prophesy to Jeroboam, who was the king of Israel at the time, and to uh, let him know what was going to happen in the future. So the prophet went and said, oh, altar, altar, and he began to speak to the altar. Even though Jer the Bible says that Jeroboam was right there servicing the altar by burning incense and so on. But the reality was he was servicing a spirit, which is at the altar, because there's a spirit at every altar. That's the principle. So after the prophet made all these declarations of doom and damnation for this altar, the Bible says Jeroboam raised his hand and says, go get him or lay hold of him. Now, the story says the only people that were there was the prophet, the young prophet, and Jeroboam. That was it. And Jeroboam was standing to the altar. But when the prophet came, he didn't speak to Jeroboam. He was talking to the altar as if he was talking to a person. He started off, oh, altar, altar, and then he went on. So the question was, who was Jeroboam talking to when he says, grab hold of him? He was talking about the spirits at the altar, get a hold of him. So and this is an evil altar. So it shows you that there are spirits at the altar. In the, whatever altar is raised, there are forces at that altar. Now, of course, we, the believers of Jesus Christ, do not have to raise altars anymore. It is not, we don't have to do that anymore because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He became the ultimate sacrifice. So this is why whatever we do in terms of Christianity as Christians, we do it in the name of Jesus because he, he is the one whereby we are reconciled to God through him. Why? Because he was crucified. 
He became the ultimate sacrifice. So we don't have to create an altar and invite God anymore. The Bible says, according to the book of Hebrews, is that because of him, we can boldly, because of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, which has pleased God, we can now boldly come through the come to the throne of grace. There's no more altars needed. Any preachers telling you to raise a godly altar or, or sacrifice and give money to the altars is foolishness. It's, in fact, I could guarantee you 98% of the preachers that tell you that came from a background of witchcraft. And I'm saying that because a lot of them still mixing up their cultic form of behaviors, ignorantly for the most part, and bringing it into Christendom. But the reality is you there is no such thing as a godly altar. There's no there's that is done away with. And when I say no such thing as a godly altar, raising one. Okay? Jesus Christ became the curse for us. But of course, you would have known that once you accepted Jesus Christ, the curse don't fall off. So what did he really do then? Well, what he did is he made the provision that once I now accept him, and this is what the preachers don't preach, and follow the rules, now I can break generational curses. Now I can break and rebuke evil dreams. Now I can do the things that I could not do before by the name of Jesus Christ, who became the ultimate sacrifice to God for me to be reconciled back to God. So when it says curses, anything come up, I, I could transfer those curses to Jesus because he became the curse for me. But in terms of because I accepted Jesus and there's no more curses, it's foolishness. Because if that's the case, then when you accepted Jesus, you should have never, all cancers, HIVs, everything should come to an end. And that it should, as long as you're a Christian, it should, sickness should never fall upon you. You should never be broke. You should never have depression. You should never lack. If you go by the understanding that because Christ became a curse, you cannot be cursed. It's foolishness. Look at the, con re that's why I always say read to understand. And in order to read to understand, to get context, you need pretext, you need post-text. When we bring it all together, we have context. It makes sense now, not pieces of something and people running off with their opinion. So when I became a Christian, when I accepted Jesus on May 17, I think it was 1996, I still was dealing with the witchcraft in my life that was upon me. I still was dealing with depression. It didn't mean that I didn't accept Christ. I did. But it doesn't end there. I, I told it to you earlier. Making declarations and shouting and screaming and not implementing the protocols that bring about what Jesus did in your life is a waste of time. So I had to do some work. I had to go into fasting. So what did he say? Even though I'm a Christian, even though he became a curse for me, what did he also say? This kind will not come out unless by prayer and fasting. So you mean I still got to pray and fast even though you became? Yeah. So what was your death, burial, and resurrection for? Because to make the provision for you to do that, to be freed. It couldn't happen without me. I, Me who knew no sin, Jesus, became sin for you. Jesus, God accepted that sacrifice. And he said, okay then, okay, as long as they use your name in faith, I will do it for them. So that is how it works. And if you believe otherwise, you're delusional because, what, again, what you're saying is that if you are no longer under a curse as a Christian, then what is sickness? Is sickness a blessing? Is poverty a blessing? Is... Uh, uh, mental illness a blessing. It's lack a blessing because that's what you're saying. They're blessings because you still have that as a Christian. So what Jesus did is he put things in place for me now that when I accepted him legally now through the name of Jesus and following the rules now, I could break these curses. I could sever these things from my life that I couldn't do under normal circumstances. That's why what happened on the cross of Calvary is a phenomenal thing. It literally changed everything for, for, for humanity. Now they have a greater power that they can rely in and on. Okay? Following the rules. So you didn't happen because you say so. By following the rules, these things can happen. So when I teach that to people, they get angry. Oh, no, no, Kevin, you are an error. Curses, anything that hanging upon a tree. And Jesus became a curse for me. Okay, good. I got you. What does that mean? Furthermore, what about grace? What about grace? Tell me about grace. You keep using the term. What does it mean? You don't even know what it means. Because all your life you hear preachers say grace and grace. And what does it mean? 
Does grace stop you from being sick? No. Does grace stop you from having cancer? No, it doesn't. Does grace stop the bullet from running through your head? No, it doesn't. Well, Kevin, what are you saying? What I'm saying is very simple. When I accepted Jesus Christ and everything that he did on that cross, I now have access to use the tools he made available for me, primarily through his name, to overcome, to annihilate, to destroy the works of darkness, because I'm coming in the name of Jesus. But make no mistake, I cannot get saved and say, right now, I accept the Lord Jesus Christ right now, and I believe I'm saved. That is correct. Now I'm going to sit here, and I'm going to wait on a bag of money. I'm going to wait on Jesus to pay off my debt. And I'm going to wait for Jesus to come cut this cancer and HIV and whatever else out of me and all this other stuff. And, and when is that going to happen again? <laughs> it's not going to happen. I have to do something, the rules, the laws, the principles. Because if that wasn't the case, we don't need the Bible. We just rely on being saved. But you know and I know that is not the case. All right? But that's a whole new different teaching. And I think I'm going to do an extensive teaching in because a lot of people are confused in that area. A lot of people can remember that the litmus test is this. When you accepted Jesus, your mortgage was five hundred and seven thousand dollars you still owe. If 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 that mortgage, in fact, the, the, the word mortgage, the word mortgage in the Hebrew literally mean uh oh god, debt, D E P T, D E B T. Anyway, whatever it is, why didn't your mortgage evaporate off the bank books? Why, when you accepted Jesus, that cancer you was battling for years. Remember, cancer is a curse. Poverty is a curse. And you just said to me, Kevin, I'm not listening to you because you're talking nonsense, but I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm not cursed. Okay, good. Then the cancer that you're dealing with is a blessing. Then. Okay? <laughs> you see? I didn't want to go here, but you leave me with no other choice. I thought it was just the transgender, transgender thing that the confusion was. But clearly we got some even greater confusion over here because something they want to be identified as a he and a she, all right? Now that's trash to me. I don't even listen to that. And I will never debate a conversation because it's stupidity. But you're no different from them. When you are convincing yourself of foolishness, if you're not under a curse, why do you still have the things that identify with a curse? Secondly, why would Jesus give all of these rules to eliminate curses such as, he says uh, in the book of Matthew 17, the boy who had the lunatic spirit or the deaf and dumb spirit. Jesus now, who became the curse, says, hey, this guy in here, even though you know me, Jesus, will only come out through prayer and fasting. So why do I still have to do that if when I accepted him, I am not cursed anymore? So, <laughs> with that said, the principles of the office at the altar is that there's a spirit at every altar. And a sacrifice has to be made with a, sorry, a ritual ending in a sacrifice has to be made to summon spirits at that altar. All right? All right, so that's why I'm giving you these things in segments. I talk about the principles of the dead. I just spoke to you about the principles of the altar. And now I'm going to deal with the principles of familiar spirits. Because at the end of these segments, again, I'm going to bring it all together in a package for you and lay it out as crystal clear as it could possibly get to show you what you're dealing with spiritually. Hence, when you deal with these things, you must deal with it from a spiritual perspective. All right? Very simple. So watch this. Let's now go to the principles of familiar spirits, all right? So going back to Deuteronomy again, Deuteronomy chapter 18, and from verse 9 to verse 11, okay? Again, when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of these nations. So what he's about to say here would have been the abominations. An abomination means things that God hated, all right? Verse 10 of Deuteronomy 18. There shall not be found among you anyone that make it a son or his daughter to pass through the fire or that use it divination. Excuse me. 
or an observer of times or an enchanter. An enchanter is one who uh, spews spells and so on. Or a witch. First 11, or a charmer. Listen, listen. Or, or a consulter. Or a consulter with familiar spirits. So he said, this is an abomination. This is what they're doing now in Canaan back then. And I don't want you, my people, the people of God, to be doing these things. So he says here, and I want you to highlight, you ought to not be, where is it, a consulter with familiar spirits. A consulter, meaning that you shouldn't be seeking the counsel or the advice from familiar. So what is a familiar spirit? Because we want this thing to make sense. So according to what I've read, a familiar spirit is a demon or an evil spirit. You all ready for this? <laughs> that aids a witch, a warlock, someone who deals with divination, tarot card reading, someone who, who does write up their horoscopes. So what does this all mean? Okay, well, how did the familiar spirit, because in the Hebrew, Hebrew language, the word familiar, the Hebrew rendering for that means to know or to be aware. Spirit, of course, means that it is a disembodied entity, meaning it doesn't have a flesh like we do, all right? What makes us human is spirit, soul, and body. Everything is in house in this shell, this body. So a spirit doesn't have a body. So a familiar spirit is a spirit that was called up from an altar. Remember I told you there's a spirit behind every altar, all right? It's called up from an altar. And this spirit, okay, that was called up, acquaints him or himself with the person who called it up. Because remember I said to you in my previous teaching that whoever is at that altar represent their family and will now be partakers unknowingly, the family because of this person, the spirit will not be able to have access to their lives. So the spirit, this is why it's called familiar, is recording everything about this family. Or even so, the familiar spirit that was already attached to members of this family will consult with this spirit from the altar. So this is why, I told you this before, false prophets. False prophets who get their powers from demonic powers, where they peer into the spiritual realm illegally, but from a demonic perspective. So the Bible just tells us, do not have any consultation with familiar spirits. But this is what a false prophet does. So the false prophet is, will call you, come up, you, you in the red hat with the red skirt, come here please. And the Lord is showing me something. So the more you learn about, I have a book here on familiar spirits. I can't remember. And I, I want to tell you because I want you to get a copy so you can get more details. What they do, the book of Isaiah said it. We're going to read it a little bit. Familiar spirits mutter and murmur and whisper. You know who would hear them? People that commit suicide. Why you said that, Kevin? Because it is these spirits that's whispering to them, in your life, nobody loved you. And they're fighting with this thinking this, that it's their mind, but it's the spirit that's doing this. You ever hear people say that, I don't know what came over me, the devil make me kill. They're not lying. There was a spirit that convinced them. The spirit of rage working with, along with the spirit of jealousy and frustration and caused them to do something that they would have never done under normal circumstances. But in any event, all of those came from some altar. However they came about, it came from the altar. All right? So God is saying, don't have no dealings. It's the first principle. The Christian should have no dealings period, with familiar spirits. Now, why? Let's go to the next rule or principle of familiar spirit. So let's go to Leviticus chapter 19, verse 31. I'm teaching you tonight. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 31. Second principle. Regard not them that have familiar spirit. Don't mess with them. Don't pay no attention to them. Don't take nothing from them. Don't go on their property. Don't take zero. Because anyone who have a familiar spirit, is cursed. They're an abomination. According to what we just read, Deuteronomy 18. Leviticus 19, verse 31, Regard not them that have familiar spirit, neither speak, neither seek, sorry, after wizards, which would be witches and warlocks also. Why? To be defiled by them. The word defiled means to corrupt you, to taint, to pollute, to change you from your original. 
So the Bible is saying by default, if you have any contact, any communication, such as the false prophet, when he puts his hand on you, when he speaks words into your life, and you say, I receive it, he tells you, raise your hand, touch you in your two hands. Do you believe the word of the Lord? Because they're seeking for your agreement. What they want to release into you, what they want to steal from your destiny cannot happen outside of your cooperation. Of course, you're ignorant to these things. So they're not going to come to you with a banner or a shirt saying, hey, look here, I'm dealing with a familiar spirit. And the truth is, we need your spiritual agreement, verbally or whatever, for us to now rob you or for us to pollute your destiny. So he says, the Lord is showing me that you're going to be wealthy. So I must say something that you like because everything that comes after that, you're going to run with. And I, and I see there's going to be an accident and, and I see death. Now, really, he's speaking a curse on you. Oh, oh, Papa, oh, Papa, oh, man of God, woman of God. And you have no idea of the spiritual language and protocols that's taking place with your cooperation and you don't even know. So God says, do not have no consultation with those who have familiar spirit. First rule, Deuteronomy 18, Leviticus 19, 31. Second rule, he says, least they defile you, least they corrupt you, least they divert your destiny. I'm I trying to help you. <laughs> I'm trying to help you. <clears throat> Let me show you how serious it was back in the day when it came to these things with God, this familiar spirit foolishness. Let's go to Leviticus 20, verse 6, and then we can jump to verse 27. Leviticus chapter 20, and let's look at verse 6. It says, And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits, and after wizards to go a whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul and will cut them off from among his people. A lot of people don't realize this, you know, and it may come to their mind tonight. God has delivered you. Sorry, you are the church. And this false prophet came there who deals with familiar spirits. And how you know, Kevin, how would you know? Because Kevin, I, I don't know these things like you. How would you know? Well, the litmus test is simply anybody who's saying to you, whose number is 357854, uh, who I see a door number, the door number says 6102 Sea Breezeway. Oh, that's you dealing with familiar spirits right away. Because familiar spirits always deal with surface stuff. If you do any study on the prophets of the Bible, not a one of them, who 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 is donkey? I see four legs, but I see like a white. White in the back of the third leg of that mule. <laughs> you can never see that. I see a donkey with, with a spread on it. No. They came and delivered the word of God and went about their business. So those who operate with familiar spirit will always try to bring the limelight to them and cause people to worship them and to give them money for the prophecies and money for revealing the future. Because in the world of sorcery, the spirits must be paid. But the truth is the spirit cannot spend the money. What the money is when it's given to the practitioner, it is a form of covenant. Again, when I tell people, they get angry at me. When you're giving money to these people, and again, I'm not discounting giving seed to a church, but listen, listen to the context of what I'm telling you. It, you, you must be aware of what you're dealing with or who you're dealing with. Because remember what you're giving that those that those monies that you give that they have to rest on their altar before they do anything with it, and it's going to tie you up financially. You will see you mark if if anyone want to be honest right now. Think about the person who prophesied in your life and everything went haywire after that, and then you never recover. That was the reason why you ignorantly came into a covenant with this false person who deal with demonic stuff, and tied you to that altar. So the altar of poverty is levied upon your life. And until that is broken, and, and another sign of it is that you will always give them, no matter how much times they ask, because that spirit is on you to give all of your resources to them, even though you don't see no change in your life. So you give and you give, and they will tell you, give it to a prophet, and you will receive a prophet's reward, and God love a cheerful giver. So they can bring the scriptures, 
but it will never line up initially. It don't make no sense. How is it that I'm doing this? I'm giving my seed, I'm giving my offering, but nothing is happening. Because unknowing to you, you are participating in an abominable act. And that is you are dealing with someone who deals with a familiar spirit. And according to the second law that I just showed you, second rule, it says they have defiled you. So prior to meeting them, you were doing well, or even yet you were on the road to do even better. But the minute they intervene into your life as this man over of God and start laying these false prophecies. And another thing how it works too, a lot of times they will make a declaration over you. But the truth is, based on the incantation before them hitting that stage, everything they say, you will get the opposite of it. I see you being filthy rich. The reality is you're going to be, I mean, abject poverty in your life. When you don't know, and I thank God, I, I, I actually had to live this, experience this, coupled with my study of the word, because it, it, it didn't make sense to me from when I came into the revelation. Of, no church never told me what I'm telling you right now. This is years of study and revelation from God, and that's why I give it for free, because I know how frustrating it could be. You give and give, and, and this don't make no sense, not knowing that you were dealing with a sorcerer under the guise of a prophet, man of God, evangelist, and apostle. I can help you tonight. So he says that it will defile you, right? Let's go to verse 27. Verse 27 says of Leviticus 20, a man also or woman that have a familiar spirit or that is a wizard shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. Wow, now that's kind of brutal. That's how serious it was. But Kevin, why would God uh, levy such a harsh punishment? Because they're messing with his plan for these people's lives. They're coming into these people's lives and literally turning their lives upside down, diverting them. This is the blessings of the Lord this way, and they're giving them this foolishness over here. The Bible says that false prophets in the book of Jeremiah has caused my people to err, E-R-R. -R. When you look up the word err or err or whatever it was in the Hebrew rendering, it means that not, it doesn't only mean to make a mistake, but to make a mistake and go into the opposite direction in which you were headed. So when a false prophet comes to your life, not only are you making a mistake by messing with them, but they're about to turn you backward in life. i trying to help you because it happened to me. It happened to me. I'm trying to help you. All right, let's go to let's go to uh, Isaiah eight verse eighteen, verse nineteen. Isaiah, Isaiah, Isaiah. Have you just pronounced it? Eight and verse nineteen. What does it say? It says, "And when they shall say unto you, seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards." That that do what? What do what do these wizards and familiar spirits do? That peep and that mutter. Should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead? So he's now giving us a little description on how familiar spirits operate. So what it all boils down, familiar spirits are conjured via evil altars. And for the most part, when they do appear in the natural, they will appear I'd say 99% of the time as an animal, as a cat, as a bird, all of these things. They could come in the form of uh, cockroaches or infestation in your home of, of rats, uh, ants, uh, bees or whatever. And it'll be strange, very uh, sinister. But you know, when I was going through the, the tax levied on my life, my where I live had no cat spirit. And I will never forget this cat who's come to my home every day. And every time I come pull up in my driveway to go to my front door, it will immediately come there quickly to try to get into the house. I remember one time, this when I had initially met Deidre. And one night, I was in my driveway, actually. And we were sitting in the car talking. And I, and I told her, I said, watch this. I said, you see that cat over there in my yard? I said, watch this. 
And just when I said that, it was just a matter of minutes later, that cat took its time, walk, and jumped, because I had a, a Jeep then, jumped on the hood of the Jeep and went to her side and literally peering into the glass. And I bang on it, and it would not move until I came out. And it still even stared at me until I went to come close to it. And it didn't even run away. It just jumped down and, and just calmly walked away. There was another time when I used to have this uh, tall-looking bird that would only come on my property at nighttime. Uh, here we call it a crane. Tall, white, long leg, long neck bird. And that bird would, right at the rear of my room, all night, stand up there in one position, all night. Even when I come outside, and I'll have to literally walk right up to it before it jump and flew, and it will make the sound, this long screeching sound. And I learned later from a book I was reading that the sound were curses that they were levering, levering because there are spirits in those birds. Kevin, stop talking foolish. There ain't no spirits, could be in no animals. Again, you don't read your Bible. The Bible is very clear. The Bible says, Jesus, who cast the spirits out of the man, who had over a thousand spirits in him, 2,000 actually. He said, my name is Legion. And the spirits were cast into the pigs. See, when you don't read your Bible, I expect for you to make stupid comments because you, you, you lack knowledge. <laughs> okay? The Bible in, uh, is it Ezekiel? Ezekiel 34 and Ezekiel 13. <coughs> Excuse me where God was about to levy his judgment on Edom. And I can't remember the next place was. And I figured that when he levied his judgment, he was going to send in other nations to destroy them. But he said he's going to send the Comorant, the Owl, the Satar, and all of these creatures. And I couldn't understand it until I went to study it. And these creatures represented demons, but came in the form of these whatever, but they were not visible. So the people that came to these places would be turned off, not knowing that there was a spiritual influence shutting them down. So the places became abandoned. No one wanted to come there to build, to develop, or do any of that anymore. So that according to the Bible, it became desolate. But it was because of the curse that God sent upon it, not through human beings to come and fight the inhabitants of the place, but these birds and creatures that he sent, which represents demons to make sure that nobody could come on this land and want to actually be here. But that's a different teaching altogether. But again, when you don't know, when you don't know the word of God and you listen to these people talk foolishness about the cake and all that foolishness, but you need a solid word to make sense out of what is seemingly uh, nonsense, okay? So these are just a few. There are many more of the laws of familiar spirit, but I just want to run through them because again, I'm going to bring these all uh, together, all right? So like I said, usually these, these familiar spirits come in the form of animals when they manifest themselves, right? Uh, just like Satan. Satan is a spirit, but when he came at Eve, how did he manifest himself? In the snake. And I could give you, I mean, myriads of scriptures. Remember in Joel chapter 2, verse 25, God says, I will restore unto you the years, listen, that the canker worm, the caterpillar, the locust, and the palm worm has eaten away. Well, what do you mean? And these insects never eat at my life. These insects represent the evil spirits that was eating away at your blessings, all spiritual. But in the form of these animals, all throughout scriptures, you're going to see this. But of course, you never made the correlation because you wouldn't have understood it. But this is how they manifest themselves. So you have these strange creatures come. Some people will have snakes all of a sudden popping up on their properties. They will have manifestation of snakes in the home. No way they could have gotten in there. All of this is manifestation. All of this showing you there's an altar working against you. All of this showing there are demonic tax levying against you. Some of you hear the cracks in the house only at nighttime, in the roof, in the wall. Uh, you hear the pots and pans moving. You hear footsteps at night. You hear strange sounds. Somebody's calling your name. You're waking up with scratches on you that you know weren't there the night before. You went to sleep with your light and air conditioner on, but when you woke up, they're off. The, the power wasn't off because you see none of the clocks blinking. So how could this happen? All of this is demonic manifestation. It's an altar working against you. Someone projecting evil at you. Okay? 
All right, so let's go to our next point. Dreams and altars. You're bringing this baby home now, getting ready to wrap up. Dreams and altars. So like I said to you before, the familiar spirits are conjured up through the rituals of spirits at that altar. Those altars, those spirits at the altars now have the right through the agreement of the human being, the witch warlock visit, or those who consult familiar spirits, as a result of that covenant, they have legal access. Now they're being projected at whomever the victim is. Excuse me. I was saying to you earlier, in the dreams that you have, when the deceased loved ones come at you or whatever it is they're doing, try to take note exactly what they're doing. For example, if your deceased loved one is giving you money, remember, the deceased loved one is not your loved one who died in reality. It is a familiar spirit, a spirit that is quite familiar with the history of your family, with the history of your relationship with this deceased person. And they realize in order to get your trust, because if they say to you, I need your trust to destroy you, clearly you're not going to do it. So they're not in stupid beings. They're intelligent beings. So they're going to use the memory of this grandmother who's deceased, whom you had the great relationship with, and they're going to appear as her. Now, I would have said in my previous teaching, one of the things with familiar spirits in a dream impersonating or masquerading as loved ones is that they never fully fit the image of the person that you know. They'll either be too skinny, too fat, or a little slanted, or very rare, if ever, you'll ever have, have direct face-to-face -face eye contact because the whole idea is to put themselves in such a position for you to believe or even assume this is the deceased person. So familiar spirits, you normally see them from the back. And I can tell you many stories of people have counsel on this where listening to me, okay, one lady told me one time that she, I think her, uh, I don't know which one of her relative it was showed up to in her dream. And she said, she told him this, let's say it was her mother. This, you are not my mother. And this thing got angry and ran away. I myself had dreams like that. See, because one of the key note speakers of the kingdom of darkness and their power is to never reveal who they truly are. That there's a saying that Satan's greatest weapon is to make people believe that he don't exist. So whenever... A, 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 an entity of the kingdom of darkness is revealed, that's a no-no. So immediately they run away or, or begin to reveal their true selves or so on. All right? I've had dreams where people were familiar with Kevin as a certain living person. And when I begin to rebuke, I remember one particular dream, it was a pastor actually, and as I begin to rebuke and just litter them with scriptures in the dream, I, I did it so much in reality in terms of practicing not practicing, but every time I pray or whatever, I would use the scriptures that I was actually doing it in the dream. And I watched this pastor begin to shed, 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 until it came down to this black, ugly creature, this demon. And when I said, for the final time, in the name of Jesus, it disappeared. So you see, familiar spirits in the dream, they can even come as animals in the dream. If you see an animal in the dream and that animal is just staring at you and not moving you, or even a person, they're in a distance. You can't see them, or even if you could see them. Not only is it a familiar spirit, it's a, it's a monitoring spirit. So what is the dream is showing you that this thing has been assigned, excuse me, to your life to monitor you. Now, for the most time, and that, that happened because of two reasons primarily. Other reasons, but these are the two reasons. The first reason is when someone has launched an attack on you spiritually, witchcraft-wise, then a monitoring spirit is automatically accompanied with that attack because that monitoring spirit has to update the practitioner in terms of what's going on with you based on the curses that are being sent at you. The second reason why that monitoring spirit will be there, and these are the primary reasons, is that whenever uh, those who are sending attacks at you cannot get through you or to you because you're doing what is right, then they still have a spirit monitoring you, hoping that you would mess up and not repent. And so now they could levy that curse now to try and get an edge on you. But they would be the two main reasons why a monitoring spirit would be in your life. Now, again, the manifestation of this would either be in the dream where you would find someone watching you or even an enemy staring at you in the dream but not saying anything. And it isn't that they don't want to say anything. The truth is because of spiritual laws, you doing what is right, curse causes cannot come. They cannot do anything other than observe, hoping you'd mess up. All right, they'll manifest in real life. You would have, uh, again, animals showing up on your property, showing up in your home, 
uh, and so on. Uh, in a case like this, I would always advise someone to get a bottle of olive oil, pray over it, and begin to anoint your home, anoint your windows, anoint your doors, and seal this place with the blood of Jesus, make declarations, no weapon formed against me shall prosper, so on and so forth. But you have to be living right. This is key. And living right don't mean living perfect, nonsense. Living right meaning that I'm living a life of confessing my sins. Because see, once confession is made, there's no legal right for the enemy. No matter what you did, you just committed an abortion, lied, murder, whatever. If you sincerely repent, God says in 1 John 1 9 that not only will I forgive you of your sins, but cleanse you of all unrighteousness. In the book of Micah, he says not, not only that, he was, he's not going to take those sins and toss them into the sea of forgetfulness, meaning that there's no more evidence for the enemy to operate on against your life because I, God, have not only forgiven you, but tossed it into the sea of forgetfulness. So confession, genuine, sincere confession is a powerful tool against the kingdom of darkness. And that, that is what I mean by once you're living right. Living according to the laws of God and confessing your sins. This is key in operating with the powers of darkness against you. If there's any infiltration in your life, any way you're being affected adversely, then there's something wrong with you. I know you're saying, well, Kevin, I'm the Christian. That's true, but there are rules. See, being, again, this is where this, this, this crazy teaching comes in from other people. Being a Christian doesn't stop you from being attacked, particularly when it's warranted. Warranted simply means that I have violated laws, I didn't repent, so I'm open to the attack. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15. If you choose not to observe the law of the Lord thy God and do his commandments, then shall the curses or the attacks come upon you. So there are rules. If, if you don't understand the rules and you do what the average Christian do, bury your head in the sand when problems come, and then you take it out to listen to motivational speech, speeches, declarations, you're going to do all of that. You're going to scream and shout, but you, you don't commit it. I'm not going to do the rules. I hear Kevin, but I, I don't have to do all of that because I'm not under the curse because Christ became a curse for me and all that mumbo jumbo, even though you see your life in peril. Okay? So rules must be followed to prevent the attacks or to put up a shield to the attacks. Uh, I'll just squeeze in this dream I had about this person one time who was attacking me viciously in real life. And I remember the, the dream started where they was trying to uh, seduce me in the dream. Now, at this point in my life, again, I always go back to the points in my life when the dream occurred. And during this time was a, a, a major time of fasting for me. Anyway, in the dream, this person had on this pink, lingerie outfit and trying to seduce me but for whatever reason they couldn't move from the point they were and as they were talking i was going in the opposite direction trying to get away until i started to run well there was these huge boulders these things had to be like a couple tons and i watched when this person did their neck like this and this huge vein came in like they became an animal they didn't turn into an animal but like they got this super strength and they picked up these boulders like like pebbles and I saw when they threw them in there at me. And I'm running, 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 running. And one after the other, they're throwing them. And I'm running. And as I'm running, I'm looking on the ground, and I could see the shadow of that boulder coming down from the sky. And at this point, I was convinced it was going to hit me. And I remember doing like this. And all I heard was boom, 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 boom like a vibration. But what it was, was this invisible shield around me that I could not see. And every one of those boulders that hit that went right back in the direction to that person. Now, I woke up out of the dream. I didn't see whether or not it hit them. But what is it showing me? It's showing me, listen, all of that fasting and praying you're doing, this is the spiritual results. Whatever, remember I tell you, everything must happen in the spiritual realm first before it could happen in the physical realm. So the weapons that were being formed against me, they could not affect me in the physical realm because the spiritual realm has shown me it's getting shut down. So you see the correlation between dreams and reality. Dreams and the altars working against you. 
Okay, so let me let me calm down a little bit. So dreams and altars, Genesis chapter 15. I'll give you two scriptures. There's a lot more, but we're bringing this baby home now. So Genesis chapter 15, let's go there quickly. I hope you're getting this teaching tonight. I'm sure you are. Breaking it down as simple as I could. Genesis chapter 15, verses 8 to 15. Where at this point, again, God came at Abraham for the second time, because he came at him in Genesis 12, and reiterating the same promises. This is 20 to 25 years later from the original promise in Genesis 12. So God said to, sorry, Abraham said to God in verse 8 of Genesis 15, and he which is Abraham said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Meaning that you're telling me again, 25 years later, I'm a, a hundred basically years old. Sarah isn't far behind. I mean, come on. I mean, when is there going to be some materialization to these promises? And watch what God is going to tell him. And he said unto him, God now telling Abraham after, he just questioned him. And he said unto him, take me a heifer, three years old, and a she goat three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So what is happening here now? These animals now, God is giving him specific instructions because now he got to make a sacrifice at the altar. So Abraham is going to create an altar, taking these specific animals at this specific age, and to do with them as specifically said by God. So you see each spirit, including the spirit of God, Back then, of course, because we don't have to do this now, will give specific instructions. And, and the instructions, when we do it, that become the agreement, giving the spirit access to our world. Let's go back to the false prophet again. The false prophet who's dealing with, who's consulting with familiar spirit. They had no access to your life before, over your finances, over your health, over your mental state, none of that. You ignorantly gave them that when they said to you, I hear the Lord say, if you take this vial of oil and for the next three mornings, you put the cross sign on your head or you do this on your door, you have no idea. You are participating in a demonic, yeah, I know they're labeled a prophet, a prophetess, a pastor and all of that other stuff. But what you don't know is that they, even though they have those titles, have nothing to do with God, but everything to do with the kingdom of darkness under the guise of God. But you don't know this. You don't read the Bible. You don't study laws and rules. Nobody's teaching you that. So they're going to say to you, you do this. But I hear the Lord says, said to seal this. And they're not lying. It is going to be a sealing. You must make a sacrifice. I can't tell you what that sacrifice is going to be but give your best. See, at this point, you don't care because whatever you give, you're not also giving authority because that money is going to go on the altar that they serve and you will become the target. And from that day forward, as sure as my name is Kevin L. Ewing, your life is going to go downhill. I promise you that. I promise you that. So watch this now. So he said, get these animals and you're going to make a sacrifice, right? Verse 10 of Genesis 15, and he took unto him all these Abraham took unto him all these animals and divided or cut them in the midst and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. So all of the other animals, he was given instructions by God specifically to cut them in the midst or cut them in half, separate them, split them. Except, it says here, for the birds, do not divide them, do not cut them. Had he done that, which God told him not to do, then God couldn't reveal to him spiritually what he's about to reveal to him right now. All right, watch this. Verse 11 of Genesis 15. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, this is the dead animals on the altars, Abraham drove them away. Okay. And when the sun, when the sun, when the sun was going down, watch this now, dreams emitted from the altar. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep, uh-huh, fell upon who? Abram, uh-huh, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. So Abram is going into a sleep as a result of the sacrifice that he made, the covenant that he made with the Lord Almighty, the spirit of the living God. is now taking him into the spiritual realm. Come here now, let me show you 
what I told you from 20, 25 years ago that you will become the father of many nations. Let me show you from the spiritual realm where it has already happened. Let me advance you spiritually to see events that you wouldn't even be able to see. You will be dead before some of these events even come to pass. But I'm going to show it to you anyway. I hope you're all listening. I hope you're all reading this. I love it. I love it. Watch this. Watch this. So verse 12 says, As when the sun was going down, he deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. Verse 13, And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety. But hold on now. Let's back up. What you mean he said unto Abram, and I just read, not only was Abram asleep, the brother was comatose. He was in a deep sleep. So who is he talking to? The spirit of Abraham. Because physically Abraham is asleep. The soulish man he's communicating with in the spiritual realm. So watch what he's saying to him now. Verse 13. And he which is God said unto Abram, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them. Okay, he's talking about when Israel will now be slaves to the Egyptians and shall afflict them for 400 years. Verse 14, and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. Uh-huh, so we know all that happened too, right? Because after God sent Moses the deliverer, and when they were about to leave, he said, no, 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 turn back and go borrow from your neighbors. They went and they borrowed. So borrow means to pay back. So God is about to cancel their debt because when the Egyptian came behind them, God closed in the Red Sea on them. So, I mean, you don't owe nobody no more because who you can pay it back to. But what I'm saying to you is God is taking Abram on the conveyor belt of the future. And as that conveyor belt is passing, he's showing him in the future, this is what's going to happen. That is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. But where is he doing this from? The spiritual realm. I love it. I love it. Verse 14, also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. Uh-huh. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. He said, I can show you your death. When you die, my brother, you will die in peace. All of this he's showing him in the spiritual realm. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. In other words, you have nothing to worry about. You can die peacefully if you fall. You've been following my rules. Now look what you did. When you came in agreement with everything I told you, even though it didn't look like it was going to happen naturally, look at what was happening in the spiritual realm that you could not see. And while you even say, you know, when is this going to happen? It had already happened. Time. The appointed times of God was just waiting for it to be manifested. Verse 16 of Genesis 15, he says, But in the fourth generation, they shall come here again, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces, I'm talking about the altars now, in the same day, the Lord made a covenant, uh -huh, with who? With Abram, saying, unto thy seed have I given this land. He's talking about Canaan now. From the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. So God says, listen, the, 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 the seed or the children that's going to come from the future generation, they're going to go into captivity and be held hostage to another nation. I'm going to send a deliverer Moses. All of this time of God has shown him, Abraham, you, you're going to be dead during this period. You're not even going to exist. You're going to be buried in your old age. You're going to, you're going to have a peaceful, good life. But I'm showing you even after you're deceased spiritually, what is going to take place on the earth. I know about y'all, but I, these stories are just, I love... I love scripture, but I have this affinity for Old Testament. I love New Testament, don't get me wrong, but I, I just, it's just, it's just incredible. So the altar is speaking. And what is really speaking? The spirit from the altar, in this case, the spirit of the living God, is telling Abraham what's going to happen during your time and even when you're not here anymore. So in other words, the dreams from the altar 
is showing, whether it's the victim or whoever, what's going to happen. Why am I constantly having dreams about my dead relatives and these evil acts and shooting and killing? Because the evil altars are showing what they want to do to you and your relatives. Just like how God showed the spirit of God from the altar, showed Abram what's going to happen. The evil spirits from that altar is showing you what they plan to do with your life and by extension that of your family. That's why you keep dreaming about your dead Grammy, your dead daddy, uncle, auntie, sister, brother, child, whoever. None of the dreams are good. Why are they giving you money? That means the altar that's working against you is coming against your finances. Why did you see you and your father rowing in the dream or you and your uncle? who They're all deceased. Why are they rowing you? It shows a spirit from that altar of division and confusion. That's what it's showing. That's what it's showing. Why do you always see your, 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 your deceased uh, cousin always naked in the dream or or having sexual acts. It shows a spirit of lust and sexual immorality from this altar. These are the specific spirits called up against you, the victim, or by extension, the family. Why you always see a deceased relatives or friends giving you money in the dream? Because they're cursing. Because remember, the deceased relatives you see in the dream are not your deceased relatives. These are masquerading spirits, familiar spirits pretending to be them to convince you, because all they want is for you to believe that. And how are you going to believe that? Based on your action towards them in the dream. So if they call you, yeah, they say, take this, I take it. They say, sign this, you sign this. Or they sign and they give it to you and you take it. That's agreement. You never rebuttal. You never refuse. So spiritually, because remember, you're physically asleep. But your soul is spiritual man is interacting with the spirit. And the only thing the spirit wants is a covenant. And how do I achieve that covenant? By getting an agreement from the human being. I trying to help you. I trying to help you. First Kings chapter three, verses one. Let's go there. We're gonna see the second one. Let's go to First Kings, First Kings chapter three, and we're gonna read from verse one to verse five. Watch this now. And Solomon made affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David, until he had made an end of building his own house and the house of the Lord. And the wall of Jerusalem ran about. Verse two. Of 1 Kings 3. Excuse me. Only the people sacrificed in high places because there was no house built unto the name of the Lord unto those days. And Solomon, verse 3 of 1 Kings 3, and Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statues of David, the laws, the principles, the rules of David, meaning David who followed the laws, principles, and rules. Solomon is doing the same thing walked in the statues of David his father. Only he, Solomon, sacrificed and burnt incense in high places. Listen to verse 4. And the king, which was Solomon, went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, just like with Abraham. But watch this sacrifice. For that was the great high place. Uh -huh. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon that altar. He burnt a thousand animals he sacrificed unto the altar of God. So clearly, this is going to now demand the attention of the spirit of the living God. So listen to verse 5. In Gibeon, that night, after all the festivities, after all the sacrifice, watch this. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in who? In a what? In a what? I didn't hear that. In a dream. Uh -huh. So this is the second time we see that the activities that was done physically on an altar invited the spirit of that altar in the dream to the one who performed the sacrifice. This is why in my teachings on fasting, I say to you, once you begin to fast, which is you are making a sacrifice, I'm not eating or whatever it is that you're not doing, whether it's you're not eating and drinking or whatever, you are demanding the spirit of God but you've got to do it the right way. You cannot, what did I say to you? Do not ever engage in a fast if you have unforgiveness in your heart. Unconfess it. Because what you are now unknowingly doing is inviting evil spirits. Why? Because fasting is a principle, meaning that it can work for good or evil. If you don't believe me, ask Jezebel. She called a demonic fast when Naboth refused to sell his property to her husband, King Ahab. So she told the elders of Israel, because at that time, they didn't serve the God of Abraham. They served idol gods under the leadership of Jezebel and her husband Ahab. 
And they said, she told him, she sent a letter as if it came from the king. He says, now have a fast and bring these evil men of Belial against Naboth for them to lie, to say that Naboth blasphemed God or the king or whatever. And as a result of that, they put that innocent man life to death. But who were they fasting to? The devil, who else? So fasting is a spiritual principle that can be used for good or evil. A lot of people don't know that. But if they read, they would know. But anyway, that's a different story. So the Bible says, after Solomon did these sacrifices, God appeared to him in a dream. What would you have me to do? I'm at your disposal. Yes, me, the almighty God. I'm so pleased with your sacrifice that whatever you ask right now, I can hook you up with it. Again, where did these dreams originate from? The altars. I hope I'm proving my point to you. It is coming from the altar. So, Kevin, let me see if I get this straight. Let me see if I get this straight. Because we're about to close up. All right? Kevin, you said that evil spirits masquerading as deceased loved ones from come from the altar. Could you provide us with some proof? Now, I believe you're, you're a man of the scriptures, so that should be easy for you. Yeah, we can, that's easy. I, that's no problem. So, Kevin, you're saying that evil spirits have the ability to transform into different things? Well, the Bible says it. I, that's not my opinion. I'm only reiterating or rehashing what Scripture has uh, uh, vehemently declared, all right? But seeing that you kind of not convinced, let me help you, <laughs> okay? So let's go to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, okay? And we're going to go to chapter 11, okay? Chapter 11. And what this is going to uh, uh, clarify, I spoke to you a lot about the false prophets, just as they are false apostles and false pastors, they are all they working for the devil, but they use these titles to uh, convince others that they are of God. But if you don't know the details of the scriptures, like I'm giving you the rules to assess them by, then like others, you will fall into their trap. And the number one trap that every last one of them have is everything you pay for, everything everything. When they're operating under demonic powers, if, again, I don't want you to get me confused. There's, don't, there's nothing wrong with blessing a ministry with a seed or blessing your past. There's nothing wrong with that. Please, I, I have to say this because people misinterpret. They, 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 they repeat what I say as if I'm saying sowing seed is wrong. I'm not saying that, period. Let me tell you what I'm saying. Whenever seed sowing process replaces the scripture, meaning that I really don't need the Bible no more. Whatever wrong I do, whatever miracles I need, whatever breakthrough, sowing a seed is going to solve it. That is where the issue is. That's the issue. When I'm given no principles other than to manipulate me, if I don't pay my tithe, I'm cursed. Nonsense. I haven't paid tithe in 11 years. I'm far more blessed than some churches, all the members put together. Why am I not cursed? Uh, the abundant life. Why are they not having the abundant life? They, they're not participating in that. They've been sown and given tithe and often all their life. Why? Because they are following rules that generate the spirit of poverty to their life, but they don't realize it. They don't realize it because they don't know scripture. And their leaders take advantage of that. So they give them riddles and rhymes and tell them about the cake and it's not lemon cake and the C and the D and blah, blah, blah. Foolishness. So in 2 Corinthians, beginning at verse, 2 Corinthians 11, beginning at verse 13, verse 13 to verse 15, Paul says to the church of Corinth, for such are false apostles. So according to scriptures, order the gate. There are false apostles. Not every apostle is a true apostle. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming, that word means changing themselves, into the apostles of Christ, pretending to be then of Christ. Verse 14. 
But he says, but don't be surprised or marvel not for Satan, their master, himself is transformed or he can change into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, that's he's speaking to the seen and the unseen here, ministers plural, I'm talking about those who are physical, that can become fake apostles, fake whatever, as well as ministers mean those who serve him, spirits who can transform as a deceased relative, spirits who can transform or manipulate their image in a dream to uh, influence the dreamer. Verse 15, therefore it is not great a great thing if his ministers or servants also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. Okay, so the scripture now, the law has just given us where Satan and his cohorts have the legal right, because that's what I'd be looking for, to change or transform into certain things, to manipulate the one whom they're trying to influence or convince or primarily achieve their covenant with to facilitate their evil. But when you don't know this, then you brag how your deceased father who died showed up in the dream and you know he's in heaven and blah, 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 and he told you this and, and blah, blah, blah. All right? I had some who said to me, Kevin, uh, I can be real with you, Kevin. There's some things my deceased relative said to me in my dream and it came to pass. And I said to them, well, that's not strange because for the most part, there are familiar spirits in the in your life who is building trust with you. So let's look at the things that they tell you were going to come to pass. And this is how you know it's a familiar spirit. And again, it's the same behavior with a false prophet. For the most part, they're saturated with spewing uh, doom and gloom. So the familiar spirit who's pretending to be a lover in a dream, uh, there's going to be a death in the family. There's going to be an accident. Now, how would they know this? Well, they're the one who's going to cause it. <laughs> they're the one that's going to be responsible for the accident next week, Tuesday. And so next week, Tuesday came and the accident happened. Nobody lost their life, but it happened. Okay? So you believe now that this is truly your relative looking out for you or whoever else because it's giving you some inside information. You might even take it as far as to say that you have seer abilities or even prophetic abilities. And this is how a lot of people get into divination and don't even know. Where familiar spirits are speaking to them in their dreams under the guise of loved one or just someone in a dream giving them this information. So they will come back and say, the Lord said, God showed me. But like I say, one of the primary pieces of evidence that is a familiar spirit 99.9% .9 of the declaration, the prophecies are always negative. I see death coming. So they will come to you. God says, get your house in order. God say this, and God, they're using God. But the truth is the information is coming from the dark side who is creating the tragedies in the future. Because the altars will always show you this is what's going to happen. Just like God showed Abraham, just like God said to so on and so forth. Once you do the sacrifice, you can see some stuff from the spiritual realm. So you see, now that we're learning these things, we have to unlearn some stuff to get even more clarity. All right? So I am going to end right here. What time is it? Because I could get so into this. Okay. I would have been on two hours and 21 minutes. Y'all don't mind, right? I just have this. This is the last scripture I can give you. And this last scripture. It's going to bring everything as usual. This is how I teach. I give you all the rules, all the principles. Not, I do not pollute anything with my ideologies. You have none of my opinion. Everything I have supported with the laws, the rules, the principles of God. Now, I am going to take you into a story of the scriptures that's going to support everything I've just told you. Okay? And I'm sure most of you who follow me should know where I'm going to next. So let's go to 1 Samuel 
1 Samuel chapter 28. 1 Samuel chapter 28. 1 Samuel chapter 28. And we are going to read, we're going to read uh, basically the entire chapter. All right? I'll probably summarize it most of it. Some, 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 do a summary most of it. Okay, so the story here is about Saul, the first king of Israel, who God at this point had rejected altogether because of his disobedience in a number of things, one of them being not annihilating the Amalekites, their king. And God was so upset with him that he sent Samuel to read the right act to him and tell him he will no longer be king, but his neighbor, which would have been David. Of course, we all know the story on that. So at this stage now, Solomon is so frustrated that he's not hearing from God that he is going to do what the average Christian does nowadays. They're going to seek uh, spirit, spiritists, uh, uh, people who claim to be of God, false prophet, false apostles, and they're going to look for prophet or prophetess. Or Again, these people are not of God. Okay, so watch this. So in 1 Samuel 20, chapter 1, 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for warfare to fight with Israel. And Achish said unto David, No. Right. And, and what's his name again? Achish? Achish said unto David, Know thou assuredly that thou shalt go out with me to battle thou and thy men. Thou and thy men. Verse 2, 1 Samuel 28. And David said to Achish, Surely thou shalt know that thy servant can that thy servant can do. And Achish said to David, Therefore will I make thee keeper of mine head forever. Verse 3 of 1 Samuel 28. Now Samuel was dead. Let's be clear here. He's deceased. And based on the rules and principles of a deceased person according to scripture, they have no more right to this planet. They cannot participate, communicate, integrate with the living. The Bible, we've read it. The, the living know they shall die, but the dead don't know squat, wherever they are. And that simply means they don't know what's happening over here. They cannot come across here. They're done. Their memory, love, hate, whatever they were dealing with emotionally, physically, financially, all of that come to an abrupt end. And according to scripture, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 5 to 6, they have no more portion or, or participation in anything that happens under the sun. So verse, th verse 3 of 4 Samuel 28 says, Now Samuel was dead. Samuel was the prophet. And all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits. So Saul finally decided to listen to something what God said. And everyone who was dealing with familiar spirit in Israel, witches, warlock, wizards, he put them out of the city. He banned them out of the city. It says, and Saul put away those that had familiar spirit and the wizards out of the land. Okay. Verse 4 of 4 Samuel 28. And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together and they pitched in Gilboa. Verse 5 of 4 Samuel 28. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, mm -hmm, nor by Urim, U-R-I-M, nor by the prophets. So all channels of communication that God will normally communicate with his people, he shut all of those communications down with Saul, who was disobedient to him. Verse 7 of 1 Samuel 28. Then Saul said unto his servants, Seek me. He's about to defy the laws of God. Seek me a woman, uh huh, that have, uh huh, a familiar spirit. Hold on now, Saul. You better be, behave here. 
Hold on, you just banned them out of the country. You tell them they can't come around here no more. Now you frustrated because God shut you down because he tired of you ignoring his command. So you are going to seek a woman, which is really a witch. And a witch is a company just like a false prophet, just like a wizard, just like a wallop with a familiar spirit. Because they cannot do what they do outside of familiar spirits, which, they, which come from the altar. So Paul is telling his servants now, because he can't hear from God, he said to his servants, seek me a woman that have a familiar spirit that I may go to her and inquire of her. Listen. And his servant said to him, behold, there is a woman that have a familiar spirit at Endor. Okay. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment and he went and two men with him and they came to the woman by night and he said, I pray thee divine or conjure up for me by the familiar spirit and bring me him up whom I shall name unto thee. So Paul, who's disguised, because she doesn't realize that this is King, sorry, Paul, Saul. She doesn't realize that this is King Saul, who he had put out of the city, her and many others. He is disguised. And he's saying now, because he clearly understands how these things work. He said, now get your familiar spirit, meaning that this is the spirit that aids you to call up someone from the grave for me. And I can name the person who I want to be called up. So clearly, he has spiritual insight. Clearly, Saul is knowledgeable about these spiritual things. So he isn't ignorant. He's fully, fully uh, cognizant here, right? So verse 8 again, it says, And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. And he went and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, I pray thee, divine, or do your divination unto me by the familiar spirit and bring me him up whom I shall name unto thee. Verse 9. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest that Saul, she didn't realize she's talking to him, that Saul had done how he had cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore they layest thou a wherefore thou layest a trap for my life to cause me to die. You can cause me to get in trouble. Not realize, and she talking to the very man who put out the city. Verse 10 of 1 Samuel 28. And Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, let's do it seriously now, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he which is Saul said, Bring me up Samuel. So in a nutshell, Saul who was in super defiance of the commandments of the Lord, insists that this woman brings Samuel back from the dead. Now, let me tell you why, before I go any further, I have to make some clarifications because I'm going to tell you later on in the story that Samuel, who she claimed to have brought up from the grave, is in fact not Samuel, but a familiar spirit pretending to be Samuel. A lot of people have read this story over and repeatedly. And they are and still is convinced, still are convinced that, Kevin, no, she really brought up Samuel. Well, let's just look back at a few things before we go any further. This is the reason why when I started this teaching, I had to give you the rules first. Because what the rules is going to do, it's going to reject all opinions. It's going to reject all what I thought it was, or what I think it should be. See, what the rules does is it set order, meaning that I cannot operate outside of these rules. This is what the rules say. So the rule said to us that the dead knows nothing. The rule said to us in uh, Luke 16, verses 19 to 31, that when the rich man and Lazarus, who were once living, died, they went to a place where none of them could come back to the planet. So much so that when the rich man had asked Abraham to send Lazarus to speak to his brother, he says, no, I... That can't happen. They have Moses and the other prophets. But as far as y'all going back there, any one of y'all, it, it will never happen in this life. Uh, Ecclesiastes 9 verses 5 to 6 says, When a person die, 
their love, their hate, and whatever activities that they were dealing with here, whatever they didn't do in this lifetime, once they have now, uh, the time of death has been appointed and they have died, they cannot come and fix nothing. They cannot aid you in anything or me. They have, they know nothing here. With that said, with all the rules said, let me put the cherry on the cake. And let's go back in the same chapter. The Bible says that Saul tried to reach out to God, but God the Almighty had shut off all communication. Dreams by prophets, by Urim and everything else, God had shut it down. The first question that should come to you before we even go further into the depths of this story, how could a witch supersede the power of God and bring Samuel out of paradise to communicate with Saul? How? When God had shut it down and dreamed, he had no prophet speaking to them. She, they, there was no Urim that whatever they used to, to, to see the future. Then not only that, wouldn't God be violating his laws, excuse me, as it relates to the principles of their people? So when you look at these factors, you could come to the only conclusion that whatever this woman brought up by familiar spirits and all. So you tell me God allow familiar spirits over the paradise. Say, come here. Even though God say, y'all can't come here. I, the familiar spirit and the witch who I does, come here, y'all come. We forget God. We can do this. This is why, let me say it again. I can say it again. Very slow. Very slow. No jumping up. Calm down. This is why you need to know laws, spiritual laws, spiritual rules. They say, Kevin, you keep saying that. What are spiritual laws and spiritual rules? The Bible. What is the Bible stance on this? What is the Bible principles or rule or law? Everything that comes out of God mother is a rule, a law, a principle. So when I gave you the principles of the deceased, what example would God be setting if he defy it? I'm, I'm listening. I'm listening. So let's finish the story now that we know the rules. So watch this. Verse 11 of 1 Samuel 28. Then said the woman, whom shall I bring up unto thee? Who shall I conjure up from the grave, Mr. Saul? And he said, bring me up Samuel. Okay. All right. And when the woman saw Samuel, uh-huh, hold on now. And when the woman saw Samuel, who's the woman? The witch. And what does the witch have? A familiar spirit. Uh-huh. And what does familiar spirit do? They can masquerade as other people, right? Watch this. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul saying, why hast thou deceived me? Thou art Saul. Because she realized if I bring up Samuel, then this must be Saul over here. Watch this now, verse 13. And the king, which is Saul, said unto her, be not afraid. For what sawest thou? What did you see? And the woman said unto Saul, listen carefully, listen carefully, because this is only going to prove it is not Samuel that she thought she brought up, but the spirit disguised as him. Listen. And the woman said unto Saul, I saw, listen, gods with a small g, mm -hmm, which are evil spirits, ascending out of the ground or out of the earth. Uh-huh. Verse 14 of 1 Samuel 28. And he said unto her, oh, okay, okay, what form is he of? What do you mean? She said she saw gods, plural. These are all spirits now coming out of the ground. Now, based on her incantation, her whatever she did at that altar, these are the spirits now based on the ritual she followed that's coming up out of the ground. So she says to him, I saw gods with an S. This is verse 13 of 1 Samuel 28. Ascending, meaning going up, out of the earth. Okay, I heard that part. But listen his response, Saul. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. I saw gods coming up. I saw some spirits coming up. So he's saying, Well, what form is the spirit in? What do they look like? Watch this now. He says, 
And he said unto her, what form is he of? And she said, an old man coming up, and he is covered with a mantle. Watch how they masquerading as salt. He coming up with a mantle. Listen, listen. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. So the scripture said, while she was doing her incantation and calling up with the aid of her familiar spirit, there were other spirits coming up. There were other gods. Other gods simply means that this is not the God, G-O-D, the, the original God of Abraham. But these are spirits. Remember the Bible says, thou shall not serve any other God. So we're still dealing with the demonic realm. We're still dealing with supernatural evil here. So while she's country, say, I, I can see, she's looking in the spirit, and I see gods ascending or coming up out of the ground or out of the earth. Saul, on the other hand, says, what, what form is he in? Meaning out of the spirits you see coming up, what, which form is, is, is one of these spirits in? And she said, I see an old man, this, this is the spirit masquerading now, as he is covered with a mantle, and it was Saul who perceived that it was Samuel. And so what he did is he stood before the spirit. Now, remember what I told you in my teaching. Spirit from the altars it will always show you or tell you what the future is going to be. Because they're showing you what they got planned. Just like when the spirit of God said to, to Abraham and to King Solomon, because of the sacrifice, this is what the future is going to hold for you. Watch this now. This can make so much sense right now. Okay. So at this point, Saul, the king, has now bowed to whom or what he think is Samuel. But it was a spirit masquerading, familiar spirit pretending or masquerading as Samuel. Verse 15 of 1 Samuel 28. And Samuel said to Saul, now when you read this and not knowing the rules I gave you before, then automatically you truly believe that this is deceased Samuel coming from the grave to meet with uh, Mr. Saul. Again, I cannot, I cannot stress this. People of God, hear me. Whatever church you go into, whatever preacher you listen to, if that preacher can't give me the word of God, which are the laws and the rules, I don't want to hear him. Because it leads for error. It leads for deception. That's why they could bring the riddles, the rhymes, and you jumping off of riddles and rhymes, and you don't know what's going on. I need to know. You saw, I need you to substantiate that, what you just said, with the rules of the scripture, so I could be comfortable with this. So I can understand the trend, the history, through the rules. Because when I don't know the rules, I talk nonsense. I talk foolery. My life will never go forward. I'm speaking curses on myself and I don't even know because I don't know the rules. But when I know the rules, I could stand in confidence and decree in confidence because I'm practicing the rules that I'm declaring. Faith without works is dead. That's what I'm saying then. Oh my God, this can get you see right now. Watch this, watch this. And Samuel, verse 15 of 1 Samuel 28. And Samuel said to Saul, the masquerading spirit, that is masquerading as deceased Samuel, because remember, Samuel is dead at this point. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, Because clearly Samuel the king is convinced that this is Saul. What did I tell you spirits look for? Primarily agreement. That's it. Now that he is convinced that this dude really believe I'm Saul, I'm about to make some declarations. And when we, be, when we jump ahead of the story, it's going to cost Saul his life. Watch this. And Samuel said to Saul, why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God is departed from me and answered me. No more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I should do. Hold on, let me see if I get this straight. God rules say that when you're dead, you have no more part in this life or anything underneath the sun. So how is it that Saul was able to escape 
the other side to come in and talk to you. God shut you down in dreams. God had no more prophets talking to you. God, Samuel is dead. Everything that you are doing is against the rules. Listen carefully. Saul answered, I am so distressed for 15, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me and, answered me, and answered me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore, I have called thee, which would have been Samuel, the deceased one, that thou mayest make known unto me what I should do. Verse 16, then said Samuel, remember, this is not the real Samuel, because Samuel is dead. This is a spirit masquerading as him. Then said Samuel, wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord, even the spirit telling him, even the Lord has departed from thee and has become thine enemy. And the Lord had done to him as he spoke by me. For the Lord had rent or tore the kingdom out of thine hand and given it to thy neighbor, even David. Verse 18. Listen. Because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executed his fierce wrath upon, um, um, upon Amalek, therefore had the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. So this demon masquerading as Samuel is telling him why the Lord has done what he did to him. But Saul so deep in his rebellion and desperation is convinced like most Christians who listen to these people, believe in all of this stuff. Listen to verse 19. Moreover, listen, this is the evil spirit saying there, moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines. This is true. This will happen for true. But it'll be because of their rebellion that's giving these forces of evil the right to do this. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee, meaning you, Saul, into the hand of the Philistines. Listen, listen, listen. And tomorrow, listen with the demon. Listen with the familiar spirit, the masquerading spirit is masquerading as deceased Saul. Listen what he is telling, about to tell Saul. And what did I say to you earlier? The spirits from the altar, evil spirits, will always show you the future. Just like uh, uh, the, the, the spirits from the, the altar of God will show you the future good things. Watch this. Moreover, verse 19, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee, which is Saul, into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow shall thou, tomorrow Saul, you and your sons will be with me. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's back up there. Back up. Back up. Saul believed that Samuel, he believed this is the real Samuel, is saying, well, you can lose your life in the war. But tomorrow, this time tomorrow, you're not going to be living. This time tomorrow, you're going to be with me. So Saul believed that, okay, well, you, Saul. Saul believed that this is Samuel, but I guess I can be in heaven. There ain't no heaven up in here, buddy. Because this is an evil spirit who's telling you the future. Tomorrow you can be down here. Where did he come from? What did the, 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 the witch say? I see gods ascending from out of the earth. So the spirit now, which is one of the spirits that is, has masqueraded as Samuel, is saying to Saul, listen to what he says. He says, and tomorrow shall thou and thy sons be with me. The Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Verse 20, then Saul fell straightway all along the earth. Or he dropped down on the ground and was so afraid because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no bread all the day and all night. So the Bible says that this spirit that is masquerading as, as Samuel, which is a familiar spirit, just like how the deceased loved ones come in your dream, that's exactly what happened to, to Saul there, all right? And I've given you all the proof, and I can, I can see this right now. And I've given you all the proof to it. And he's saying to him, God is going to deliver you and the Philistines into the hand you and Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Because this, this was the altar already had prepared. And God must now give the permission because Samuel and, the, and Israel is in full rebellion. So these things are true. So you see how a false prophet, just like a familiar spirit, who aid them, who aid witches, warlocks, and wizards, could give you partial truths and a bunch of lies to convince you. 
But what are they really seeking? Covenant. So Kevin, did you are you saying to us that Saul died because he was dealing with a familiar spirit? Well, that might not have been entirely the reason, but I was a part of the reason. And I will end with the scripture to prove my point. Let's go to First Chronicles. I can prove my point. And we can wrap up radio. First Chronicles. I love to prove my point. <laughs> First Chronicles chapter 10 and verse 13. And we can seal this case right now. First Chronicles chapter 10, verse 13 says, So Saul died for his transgression. Uh-huh. And which was that? Which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not. Uh-huh. And also, uh-huh, for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. I rest my case. I'm done. I am D-O-N-E. If you sat through this entire teaching and you still believe that the deceased people that you dream about are really those people who've already passed on, then you must not have listened to anything that I would have said. I gave you no opinions. And if there was an opinion from my end, it would be in line with everything I just told you. I gave you the rules first, the principles and the laws that governed what I was about to tell you. There is nothing that I have said to you that was not supported by the scriptures. So in, over, in essence, the story in 1 Samuel 28, the Samuel that was claimed to have been brought from the dead was by means of a familiar spirit. All right? The evidence is overwhelming that it was not Samuel based on all of the violations, all of the rules that God put in place that were violated. Okay? And for a familiar spirit to go to the spiritual realm and remove a true man of God, such as Saul, whom God had severed all communication, sorry, to remove a man of God such as Samuel, when God had shut down all communication with Saul, I mean, let's be real here. Would God allow that? No, he wouldn't. So they were all familiar spirits. My friends, ladies and gentlemen, those who follow me, hear me and hear me well. You must rebuke, cancel, reject any dream, even if it appear to be a good dream, of a deceased loved one, reject it. Why? Because if the dreams are constant, you're always dreaming about deceased people, it's an evil altar working against you. And the evidence of that, aside from just the dead people itself, your dreams are literally nightmares after nightmares, killing animals, monsters, creatures running behind you, snakes, and so on. All of this is what the altar is showing what it wants to do to you. Torment your life, bring confusion. And all of the symbols are going to be there. You see homosexual acts in your dream. It speaks of confusion. You see people giving you money. It speaks of uh, a curse of poverty they're trying to get you to come in agreement with. You see you fussing and arguing with deceased relatives. All of this talk about utter confusion and discord in your life, all being emitted from the altar. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word tonight. We thank you for your wisdom, your knowledge, your understanding. God, I so thank you. I thank you for what you allowed me to go through in my life. The turmoil, the disappointment, the pain, the shame, the fighting after fighting, the, the losing of battles. All of this brought me to a point in my life to see the bigger picture, and that is the spiritual world. Father, in hindsight, now I understand, according to Romans 8 and 28, that all things, not some, everything, is working together for good for those who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. I thank you because your word declares in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18, and it says that we must give thanks in all things, the good and the bad. 
for this is the will of you concerning us in Christ Jesus. Father, when these things are happening to me, when my back was against the wall, when the pain, the shame, when the hurt, when the unfairness was running its course in my life unhindered, I didn't understand it then. I didn't know that these were the building blocks. I didn't know that this would become the platform for one day me to stand on and to share which was once my pain coupled with the laws, the rules, and the principles to your people to bring clarity to them, for them to understand the spiritual laws, the spiritual rules. I thank you, Father God, and I'm assisting them in unlearning some stuff, getting rid of some stuff, and to really look at the heart of what they're dealing with. The Bible, your book, your constitution is a book of laws and rules and principles. We cannot shout our way to victory. We cannot scream our way to victory. We cannot declare our way to victory. Father, just like in the case of Jehoshaphat, and when the children of Mount Seir and Ammon and every other nation was coming against them, Father, your word declares that there were some rules that was given to them. The angel or the prophet or whoever said to them that when the day come for them to fight, that they must go down in the valley. These were some instructions, but they will not fight. They will not fight, but watch and see the salvation of the Lord. You further went on to tell them that if they believe your prophet, they will prosper. But it came as a result of them following your instructions. When they followed the instructions and believed that, see, everything had to work in harmony. It wasn't a lot, it wasn't where they just went down in the valley and shouted and praised the Lord and victory came. No, they had to obey and go down in the valley in the valley and not fight. The Bible says in that Jehoshaphat had all the choir and everybody come and praise the Lord after following the instructions. In other words, we cannot have one without the other. We cannot have everything coming against us and then we going into praise and worship, but we don't want to follow the rules. We still want to carry hate. We still want to carry bitterness. We still want to carry unforgiveness. We still want to be spiteful, vindictive, and petty and break every rule. But because the preachers say, give God the glory, let us give a shout to the Lord, let us somersault and flip, we believe that by just doing that, we will secure victory. The devil is a liar. Father, your word is very clear in the book of James. Faith, meaning the word of God without works is dead. In other words, this is the law. I must do the law, which is the works, coupled with my belief of what I'm doing. Then I will get the manifestation of what God promised. But I cannot just do or decree or declare or speak in tongues and do foolishness and, and, and bypass the rules that I ought to be executing and expect for the promises. It's the devil is a liar. Father, I thank you for opening up my eyes. I thank you for clearing up my understanding of the scriptures. I thank you for giving me clarity and removing the scales from my eyes. No longer will I sow seeds for your miracles. No longer will I sow seeds for you to do what you have asked me to do through your rules because I know it didn't work then. It will never work. What will work is when I obey. This is what your word says according to Deuteronomy 28 verse 1. If I will obey and hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God and observe to do and observe to do, not just here, but to do. He says, I will set you on high. I will promote you now. Why, why are you doing this, God? Because I only shouted victory. Because I said, I know I'm going to be a winner. Because I declared victory. No, 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 Kevin. No, no, no. You, you read my word and you actually did it. And now manifestation. He said, I will set you on high. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God and observe to do, to do, to do all his commandments. I will set you on, I will promote you. And I will bless you in the field, bless you in the storehouses, bless you in the fruit of your, thy, thy body, bless, bless you in every... He says in verse 8 of Deuteronomy 28, he says, because you have observed and do, I will command the blessing towards you. Mighty God. You all hear this? I will command the blessing before you. 
You mean because I just shouted? No, Kevin. Because I said victory is mine? No, Kevin. Because I said chandala, mandala, blah, 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 blah. No, 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 no. Because as you can see, those who do that are still waiting on the whatever promises. But those who observe the laws, read it, and now they're doing it. Because faith without works is dead. They will now be the participants and recipients of the promises of God. Because God works, cannot return a them void. Very simple. Very simple. Father, I pray right now that an anointing to do rests upon this people right now. An anointing to execute the rules right now. I pray, Father God, that they will abandon that foolish, ignorant, stupid mindset of believing that they could just decree something and sit back and it will just happen. Foolishness. What will happen is once they do what has been instructed, now they will see the manifestation. Father, your word declares according to the book of Proverbs chapter 4, verse 13. It says, grab fast hold of instructions. Keep her and not let her go. Why? Why is he so adamant about this? He said, because she, which is instruction, is what? Thy life. Did he say shouting is thy life? No, he didn't. Did he say make a roar? Is, no, he didn't say that. Did he say shandala mandala speaking? And, no, he didn't say that. What did he say is your life? The instructions that he gave and you apply. Father, we repent for listening to everybody except you. We repent for believing that we could decree and not do, but still get the promises. We repent, Father God, for not doing it the way you've asked us to do. Because what we have seen is quite the opposite. Your word declares, according to Deuteronomy 28 verse 15, If thou shalt not hearken and do the words of the Lord according to the law, then shall these curses come upon thee, backwardness, frustration, poverty, lack, sickness, but how could this be and I'm a Christian? How could this be and I speak in tongues? How could this be and I'm making declaration and prayer points and so on? Because you did not hearken and do. You listen, but only declared. But you never did what you were instructed to do. I told you to forgive your neighbors. I said, while praying, forgive others so that your heavenly father will forgive you. You said no. I said to help the poor, you gave it to everybody else except the poor. So if you did not do, you cannot get. So you will stay in the lane of those who shout and scream and do all this sort of stuff, but there's never no manifestation. Father, I pray. I pray that the eyes of your people will be open. Father, I stand in agreement with everyone that will agree with me tonight. This day, Father God, we renounce. And we repent of every false prophecy, every false declaration, every false teacher, every false prophet, every false prophetess, every one of them we gave our monies to, everyone we came in agreement with, ignorantly of course, we repent right now. Every altar our monies were placed on not knowing that it was tying us down and robbing us of our destiny, particularly our, our virtue, our finances, it all went demonically to those that robbed us spiritually. But Father God, we stand on your word, Joel 2 and 25, because you knew these things would have happened and you knew we would now accept the truth. And you said in Joel 2 25 that you will restore unto us, mighty God, all the years. I thank you, God, that you are a proactive God. You knew in advance you knew in advance that we would have been deterred. You knew in advance that some evil would have intervened in our life and suspended our destiny. But there's a rule, there's a law where you accommodated this nonsense right here. And you said in Joel 2 and 25 that you will restore unto us the years that the canker worm, the caterpillar, the locust, and the palmer worm has eaten away. Give it up. Your word declares in the book of uh, Proverbs chapter 6, verses 30 to 31. And you said, these are all to benefit those who finally come to their senses. You said, if the thief be found based on this teaching tonight, we didn't know that our encounters with the deceased in our dreams, which were all robbing familiar spirits and robbed us of what was already in place for us. You said, your rules, Proverbs 6, 30 to 31. If the thief be found. 
and we have discovered him tonight. We, you've given us this power. We must demand of that thief to return unto us at minimum sevenfold of everything that he has stolen. So with that said, Father God, we stand on the promises of your word, which is yea and nay. Yea and amen, sorry. And what your word says, it cannot return unto you void. We command by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, everything that the enemy has stolen from us, according to Proverbs 6, 30 to 31, and the power invested in us, we command and demand that the kingdom of darkness give it back at minimum sevenfold right now. Right now in the name of Jesus. Right now. Father, we believe by faith in the realm of the spirit, there is activities going on where the angels of the Lord, when we speak the word of God, according to Psalms 103 verse 20, that the angels of the Lord must not perform, not to our word, but according to the word of the Lord that we speak. So we're declaring uh, Proverbs 6, 30 to 31. Now we believe by faith. We don't need to see it. We believe by faith that the angels right now are dismantling the kingdoms of darkness and taking out of their treasury everything that they have stole from us and sevenfold of what they originally took. Your word declares, I love it, according to Proverbs 11, verse 31, 8. And it says, the righteous, that's us, we qualify, shall be recompensed or repaid in the earth. Father, we receive right now in the name of Jesus. We stand on Proverbs 11, verse 31, 8. The righteous shall be recompensed in the earth. Your word says in the same chapter, part B, so much more the wicked and the sinner, meaning that they will get more damages done to them than what they have done to others. Your word declares according to Hebrews 10 verse 35 that we should not cast away our confidence or our belief in the word of God for it shall work for us a great recompense of reward. In other words, we will receive or exceed more in receiving than what we have lost. So this night we stand on the word of God because the word of God says according to Proverbs 11 verse uh, 9b through knowledge which we would have received tonight shall we the just be delivered. Deliverance has visited your home tonight through the knowledge of God that you will apply and do. You must do it. It is foolish of you to believe that you could praise your way or your sickness alone. Speak your way. You, you could do that, but it must be accompanied with works. And what is the works? I must forgive. Okay. I must help the poor and whatever else God tell me to do, I must do. It must, my, my declarations and my belief, which is faith, must be accompanied with the action. The Bible is very clear. The Bible says in Proverbs 13 verse 18 that poverty and shame shall be the portion of those that refuse instructions. So this night, Father God, we bask in your glory. We bask in your wisdom, your knowledge. This night, the spirit of wisdom and knowledge and understanding have been dispersed among your people. No one is exempted. All of those who want to partake of this have, have they can gorge on this right now. So I pray, Father God, that you would really, really, truly, your word declares, I think it's in 2 Corinthians uh, 3, verses 3 to 4, and it says, if, if our gospel be hid, the good news of Jesus Christ, if our gospel be hid, it's only hid from those who don't believe in whom the God of this world, Satan, has blinded their minds. Father God, I pray for the unshackling of minds right now. Your word declares according to Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and it says that we must not be conformed to this world, but we must be transformed or changed by the renewing or the repairing, the repairing of our mind, so that now, now, we could prove what is that good and acceptable will of God for us. Now that we will know whether or not this or that or whatever is of God. And the only way that that can happen is that um, there must be a repairing. In other words, our minds need to be fixed. In other words, our minds in its current state outside of the repairing is an enemy unto us. So Father God, I pray what you have done for me. You have blessed me. You have repaired my mind. You have given me wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, insight. Father, I am begging you. I am beseeching you. I want you to do double for this people. For those who believe, Father, I pray for a double portion. This is how much I want them to have it. I don't care if they outdo me. 
It don't matter to me. I, I in my lane. I know what I do. And I love what I do. I love what you're doing for me. But I am asking you, Father God, to give them a double portion of what you've done for me. Those that truly believe. Those that truly abandon tradition and commit to what the word say. Not what pastors say if pastor is going against the laws of God. Father, you did not tell us. Send nothing back to our enemies. Sending back any curse, hex, spell to our enemies is a violation against the laws of God. Your word is clear. You said it has been said of all, an eye for an eye, a tooth for tooth, but you said, now I come to amend it. But I, God, say, don't curse them. Bless your enemies. Pray for those that despitefully use you and say all manner of things against you. So, Father God, I come and I join my faith. I join my faith with those who are ignorant of this. And we all repent for sending curses against our enemies, for praying against us. We were violating your laws. This is, again, why you weren't manifesting anything in our lives. Your word is very clear. Bless your enemies. Yes, and for those who say, should God, your, the word says, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. That was under the Old Testament. That's the Old Covenant. That was a part of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But Jesus says, I come now to amend it. Even the witch I'm telling you to bless. Bless those that curse you. And pray for those that despitefully use you and say all manner of things against you. If they slap you and once you turn the next one, let God deal with them. All of this is a part of you, helping you to forgive and let go. So, Father, we bless you. Father, we honor you. Father, we praise you. And we ask these things in the matchless and the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. So, folks, that is it for me. That is it for me. <laughs> I, I feel super good tonight. So that is it for me. That is it for me. Listen, I don't know if I'm going to be on tomorrow. I cannot promise you that. But what I do know, though, is uh, Saturday, I'll be starting my series on poverty and being poor. And that's going to run for this entire month. I have some awesome revelations God shared with me. My first sermon on Saturday, I just completed it today. Uh, so I will be back, God spares life, on my radio program, uh, the Kevin L. Ewing Spiritual Insights Show from 12 noon to 2 p.m. on Saturday. It's going to be very, very awesome. And uh, I pray that you would be there also. Until then, you have a blessed night. Please go over this recording and, and listen and let the revelation and the knowledge of God marinate your cerebral cortex. Got to get a little medical on there good for you. <laughs> but on a serious note, Obey the laws of God, because that's what God, 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 you, whatever God do in your life, it's going to be as a result of the laws you follow. So in other words, your life is a sum total of the laws and rules and principles you commit or did not commit to. But in any event, wherever you are today, it is as a result of you adhering or rejecting the laws of God. This is why it's imperative. And people stop writing me and asking me, what are the laws of God? The Bible is the laws of God. No need to get technical here. There are more than just the Ten Commandments. You are asked to not curse people. That's a law. So when you pray prayers against other people, when you send back things sevenfold, you are violating the laws of God. Not Kevin. That's a law. All right? You are told to pray for those that use you and talk behind your back and say evil things about you. Pray for them. Not curse them back. Not gossip, gossip about them. These are laws. These are rules. All right? So anyway, I'm done. You all have a blessed night. God bless you. And may the peace of God be with you.